Hello everybody, I'm happy to be here to be the virtual host of the 2020 edition of ICGT, the International Conference on Graph Transformation. I'm Fabio Gaducci and I'm together with Timo Keherer, I'm the chair of uh, this year edition. Uh, Timo will be able to tell you more a bit about uh, what's going to happen concerning talks and putting up some statistics and so on and so forth. For the time being, just let me tell you that I'm very, very happy that uh, we were able to finally manage to go fully virtual for this, uh, for this year. And uh, well, re uh, recall to check uh, the web page for having all the information about uh, the talks, the times and they dedicated the YouTube channel for each uh, session. And basically that's it. Welcome to everybody and uh, please Timo, go ahead. It's up to you. All right. So I'm just trying to share my screen for the presentation slides, which you should see now. Yes. Looks good, right? Go ahead. It's fine. Oh, okay. So, uh, also a very warm welcome from my side um, to this year's ICGT, which, uh, well, is a kind of uh, special one, actually, um, for reasons that we are all aware of. Um, so actually, uh, the place where we would have liked to be now is uh, somewhere in uh, Norway, in Bergen, to be uh, to be precise, enjoying a little bit uh, the Norwegian summer and um, the beautiful landscape around Bergen, and to meet the colleagues, um, of course, and to have physical talks. Um, that was not pro uh, possible, so as you have heard, uh, stuff uh, was postponed to, to next year, which is actually the good news, so we can be hopefully in Bergen uh, next year. Um, the various conferences and workshops uh, that are under the umbrella of stuff, um, they all took different decisions ranging from postponing it to next year, from canceling it, uh, particularly the, the workshops maybe, which, which doesn't make so much sense to do in an online um, uh, workshop format. Uh, for ICGT, um, we, we also discussed the different options together with the steering committee and we finally decided to have it as an online conference. We have a lot of papers um, this year, um, so we thought it's, it's a good idea to have um, yes. all of these papers presented even in an online fashion. And so I'm very glad that, that Fabio and uh, the technical staff from University of Pisa um, managed uh, uh, something for us. So should be pretty easy for the audience to follow the talks on the YouTube channel of uh, the University of Pisa, which you, which I assume you have found already. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't see me now. Um, there is still some option for interaction. So um, all the people from the audience, um, you are very welcome to um, type in your comments and questions already during um, the talks. Um, we have the regular concept of, of session chairs um, uh, who are trying to somehow manage um, uh, the sessions and, and having a look after the the schedule, and they will um, take up your questions after each of the talks and forward them somehow to the speaker. Um, the speakers of a session, they are all in, in our StreamYard uh, uh, session, so they can interact um, kind of live with each other. But yes, to, to say it again, so, so you are more than welcome to, to participate in the discussion by typing in your comments and questions. A um, little bit of history. Um, yes, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. As we all know, this year it was um, a little bit more extreme than usual. So um, 
the first thing we we, we actually had to do is um, we extended the the, the, the deadlines uh, a bit. So the decision was not that easy um, to extend uh, the deadline because we already know that uh, or knew at that time that the reviewing schedule will be quite tough. Um, <clears throat> we were looking for, as researchers, of course, we were looking for evidence that it was a good decision. And of course, we found a statistic that uh, told us, yes, it was because most of the submissions were received um, exactly on the date uh, of uh, uh, on the due date for abstracts. Um, so we were confident with our um, decision. Confidence level decreased a bit when we received um, even more requests for granting a grace period, but because um, at that time it was the time where many countries were short before the lockdown and we had other problems maybe than ICGT papers. Um, we decided to also grant that uh, that grace period of another week. Um, so we received the final papers on March 11, actually. Um, well knowing that we have to notify the authors about um, acceptance or rejectance um, in, in, in the mid of April to come up with the proceedings on time which ended up in a very tough reviewing schedule anyway, um, thanks to the PC members, which I will not uh, mention here by name. You see the PC on that slide. Um, thanks to everybody. It was really um, a difficult time, I think, when, when we had to do the reviews, but uh, we finally made it. Um, all papers have been um yeah peer reviewed in the in the usual manner we also had some additional reviewers which should also be mentioned and you see them on that slide of course they also appear in the proceedings so thanks to all who did a very great job during that um, very tough and, and kind of specific reviewing period little bit of statistics on the submissions. Um, so in sum, we received 39 submissions, which I think is a, is a very good number. Um, for, for ICGT this year, we could accept 22 uh, papers out of these 39 submissions. Um, and regarding the paper categories we had, um, <clears throat> these are 16 full uh, research papers. We have four tool demonstration papers and two papers um, in a category, category which we called uh, new ideas um, papers. So actually, um, these were uh, summaries or short summaries of uh, papers which have been already published in a peer-reviewed uh, conference or journal other than ICGT recently. So the formal criterion was that it's, uh, the publication date must be um, past um, 2018. So these short summaries, we wanted to have them actually in the proceedings, but uh, uh, the, the Springer guys from LNCS were not happy with having two page summaries of already published papers, which, okay, in the end, we could also kind of understand. So they didn't make it into the proceedings, but uh, what I wanted to say um, here is that we will have special issues after the um, after the conference and two journals. I will come back to that in a minute. And uh, for these special issues, the new ideas papers, which will also be presented as regular papers in the program, um, by the way, they will also be considered for these special issues. But coming back to this in a in a minute. Um, yeah, you already uh, realized that we love statistics. And so here is another one uh, showing the submissions by country. And as always with uh, statistics, I mean, you can interpret this in many ways um, up to your uh, personal preferences. Possible ways to interpret this would be that um, the submissions are not only dominated by European submissions um, because uh, the second most um, uh, yeah, sub number of submissions stem from the UK. And uh, so thanks to Brexit, it's not only dominated by European submissions. There are other things you could uh, figure out here. So submissions from Italy, uh, Spain, Denmark, and Sweden, and also the, Nether the Netherlands uh, have a 100% uh, acceptance rate. Mm -hmm. Or um, interpreted in the way 
uh, you want. Um, what's actually more important is that from all of those submissions, I think we could compile a very interesting uh, program, which is divided into seven sessions uh, on different topics. So we will start with uh, the uh, topic of nets and biographical structures, uh, covering three talks. Then we have uh, two talks uh, in the category of logics and algebras. We have quite several talks, um, five to be precise, around topics like attributed graphs, application conditions, graph constraints, graph consistency, and uh, things like that in, in the afternoon. And also tomorrow there are interesting mm -hmm. <clears throat> sessions, um, papers on novel formalisms, um, graph languages, uh, so more application-oriented papers um, <clears throat> in the area of system modeling. And last but not least, um, we will have the four tool presentations that will somehow complete our program. In between, um, we are very happy and glad to announce an invited talk, uh, which will be given by Bob Köcke. It will be today, directly after the uh, after the lunch break at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Central European Summer Time. Um, and um, yes, I'm very excited about this one. Uh, so uh, Bob is uh, is a professor of quantum foundations, logics, and structures at the Department of Computer Science at University of Oxford. And well, while he's doing research on the foundations of physics, um, which might at first glance sound not so ICGT related, um, having a closer look on, on what he's doing, he is particularly interested in the underlying structures uh, of these foundations of physics, with a special focus actually on logic, category theory, and uh, their applications in that field. So um, in turn, actually, this, this perfectly fits to, to ICGT topics. And once again, uh, we are very glad to have Bob as an invited speaker. I read, uh, by the way, maybe he's already listening us. I read uh, the summary of his talk and I didn't understand anything, um, but uh, that makes me even more excited to hear the talk because maybe it's hard to deliver some contents like this in a two page summary. Uh, for the proceedings, we got an email at um, nine o'clock. So just uh, an hour ago, there are available online. So we, we finally made it. Um, uh, th this is the link. I think you don't have to capture it. Uh, Fabio uh, will somehow provide it on the on the web page or we will find a, a solution to, to deliver uh, the, the, the link to you. So yeah, um, just in time, the proceedings, at least the online version, um, made it uh, to be ready uh, for the conference. Um, these will be the two special issues that I already mentioned uh, a minute ago. So we are very pleased to have two confirmed uh, special issues for uh, ICGT 2020, which are devoted to the more theoretical and application-oriented uh, topics. Um, so they will disappear. Uh, they will appear in in the LCV journals on theoretical computer science and in science of computer programming. Um, Fabio and I will contact <clears throat> all authors of selected papers um, after the the conference and invite them to extend their work towards uh, a journal submission in one of those two journals. The invitation, of course, will then include the planned reviewing schedule. The rough idea is to collect the submissions by fall 2020 and, um, well, to finish the reviewing process over potential minor or major revisions, um, to have these papers published um, by the date of the next ICGT in 2021. 
Okay, and um, this is the concrete schedule. If there should be dynamic updates, uh, which might always happen, of course, um, we will um, announce them on the ICG, ICGT website. Uh, for now, the plan is like this. So after the um, yeah the opening session, which is um, which we are right now, um, we will have the the session on nets and biographical structures, then logics and algebras. Uh, and then we will have a lunch break. So as you as you see, the the, the general pattern is that between one and two, uh, we will have the lunch break, um, and um, roughly divide the whole schedule in a morning and an afternoon session. Another observation mm, you might have already made is that they are not the typical coffee breaks. Um, we were discussing this, of course. Should we should we introduce more breaks uh, into the program? Finally, mm, we came up with that program where the idea is that probably most of you will uh, somehow uh, drop in and drop out into the different talks uh, depending on on personal interests and since we will have not the chance to have the, the regular coffee breaks with uh, talking to colleagues anyway, we think that people will somehow make their, their own individual breaks, right? And that's why we finally mm, went for a more compact uh, program. We left out the, yeah, the, the, the typical coffee breaks and we will see how this, how this works um, and we just hope that that you are happy with that, um, and um, yeah. So we we end uh, today uh, and tomorrow at half past five. Um, the closing session tomorrow will probably not half an hour, so we will be a little bit earlier tomorrow. And well, yes, we 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 hope that. Um, Despite all the problems uh, we have, and despite this is an online conference and not in the in the usual style, um, that we will have an interesting conference program um, with interesting talks and with at least a, a little bit of interaction. Uh, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> That's it for the welcome. Um, we not only have a welcome, you already saw that the, the session title is Welcome and Announcements. And with that, I want to hand over to Gabi Tenzer and Raiko Heckel. I just have to finish my screen sharing. Did I forget anything, Fabio? No, no. Let me just add that this link to the proceedings for Springer is already available on the web page of the conference. So okay. everybody can go there and check the, if everything worked fine. We, we were very grateful, actually, to Springer because it was indeed kind of rushed. So that the, the, they wrote us, like uh, Timo told before, at uh, 9 o'clock and saying uh, we made it and that's it, not bad. So uh, thanks, Timo, for, for the overview. And uh, now I think it's up to, to Gabi. Unfortunately, right for the time being, is not here. But uh, uh, you can start giving the presentation of uh, something which has been, uh, how can I say, expected since some time from the community, right, Gabi? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I hope you see my slide. <laughs> uh, Is that okay? One moment and they will be added to the stream. Here we are. Okay, so hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm very happy that uh, Fabio and Timo um, uh, yeah, give us a time to present uh, our book. Um, so Raiko should also be there. Um, but anyway, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so yes. this, is, this is the book you uh, hey, maybe heard some rumors about it uh, since years uh, that we are writing it. And so finally, it's available. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it's a book by Raiko Heckel and me on graph transformation for software engineers with applications to model-based development and uh, domain-specific language engineering. And uh, you can uh, get it from Springer, but I will tell you later on that you can also get it 
in another way. And uh, yeah, so we are very happy that uh, in the end uh, this book uh, appeared. And uh, so the the first ideas to this book were um, yeah around 2000 2001. And uh, it was together with Mauro Petze and Gregor Engels, Luciano Baresi, and uh, Hartmut Erik, and uh, and uh, later on also with Arend Rensing. And um, yeah, but as it is, sometimes uh, good things uh, last for a while. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the, the authorship uh, changed and, and the content changed over the years. But finally, yeah, now it's available. And um, now I want to uh, show you some uh, information about the book. And the first is the table of contents. So the book um, contains of two parts. And the first part is about foundations of graph transformations. And here we give an introduction to graphs and graph transformation and also to analysis techniques, but uh, in a very informal way. So um, yeah, we expect that the reader does not know much about uh, formalisms, uh, but want to hear about uh, the concepts of graphs and graph transformations. And uh, in the second part, um, we apply graph transformation to a lot of different uh, topics in software engineering. And um, so this is uh, the list of chapters uh, uh, in the book. And uh, you see from uh, the titles, it goes through the main tasks of the of software engineering, like requirements engineering and uh, design of services and uh, model-based testing and also reverse engineering and uh, stochastic analysis. Um, and uh, the last uh, three chapters, they are about um, the design of domain-specific um, modeling languages. Uh, as you need them in uh, software engineering, especially in model-based software engineering. And uh, here it's uh, yeah how graph transformation can help in that way. So some highlights uh, going back to part one. And in part one, we try to uh, combine a lot of uh, different concepts that are around. So we do not stick to a specific approach like, yeah, <laughs> Double push-out approach or, or similar, but uh, we try to give a, a very broad overview and to do um, yeah a kind of feature-based domain analysis of uh, the domain of graph transformation, and uh, so we come up with uh, some uh, feature models showing uh, yeah the different um, features concepts of graphs and graph transformations. So these are just two of them, and you you find more in the book. And uh, for the analysis techniques, we give an overview of um, yeah, common analysis techniques. And here you see, for example, um, a table where you have on the top uh, some of the um, analysis techniques that are around for graph transformation. And uh, on the side, you see um, yeah, different kinds of questions that could be asked for uh, graph transformation systems. And um, it depends if we want to describe a language or a relation or a transition system with a graph transformation system. And so the, the questions are uh, uh, correspond to them. To sum up, um, yeah, we got uh, some nice uh, forwards uh, from uh, different uh, researchers uh, from the field. And here, so to just have one representative, uh, it's uh, part of the forward of Carlo Getzis uh, saying this book is the first comprehensive and systematic presentation of graph based modeling and applications to the practice of uh, software engineering. It can be used in teaching to present the foundations of software modeling and verification. Yeah. And there are further forwards by Mauro, Petze, Luciano, and Gregor Engels, uh, by Marsha, Czechik, and uh, a very um, personal one because we worked a lot uh, with Arend Rensing. And uh, yeah, so he helped us a lot to um, finish this. 
book. And uh, further information to this book can be found at this uh, website here. And uh, you also can get um, a, a PDF from this website of the whole book. And in addition, you can get some slides and also some exercises. Uh, we are still working on this, uh, and it, it will be extended in the near future. But yeah, the main information is already there. And ideas for the future we have is uh, that, um, yeah, somehow uh, when working on part one, especially, um, we, we collected a lot of uh, information. And so we are um, dreaming of um, having um, very uh, yeah, expressive Wikipedia pages on graph transformation, where we can collect a lot of uh, different ideas, concepts about graph transformation. This would be very nice. And uh, yeah, we are also interested to reach out uh, to software engineers um, with this book and uh, hopefully also to other communities. And uh, every ideas you have about that, and, and in general, every comment you have about uh, the book, um, yeah, please tell us. We are very interested in that. Thank you. Thanks, Gabi. I do not know if uh, Raiko is there. Hi, Raiko. If you want to add something, uh, yeah, maybe or just two, two. Or uh, if we receive some question from the audience, not so far. Even maybe if just there is two. Clear. Hmm? Maybe just Go two, ahead, Raiko. two points. Yeah. So one, I, I actually looked up the dates. I think they are also in the in the in the preface of the book. So I think the first time we actually talked about this and this, this was proposed was in two thousand one after ICALP or at, mm -hmm. at ICALP with Mauro Petze. And, and um, I think the first time this was officially announced as being nearly ready was in 2004 at ICGT in, in Rome. So it's taken <laughs> not even 16 years to make good on that promise. So, so who can complain? <laughs> um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, um, we have, um, I mean, this idea about the Wikipedia page and maybe using this, um, basically using the structure of the book, especially of the first part where we basically took a lot of effort to sort of organize the concepts. Yeah, you've seen those those feature models, these, these feature trees in a sense, these are basically classification trees for concepts. Um, so the idea of using that for, for, for creating a Wikipedia page that is maybe accessible to all and not as heavy as a, as a book, I think it would work if um, basically there's buy-in from the community. So if people are interested in actually using that and also contributing to it. So we can set up a basic structure and we can set up sort of a first version of some, some of the content. Uh, and I think we have more or less the right sort of level of presentation for, for, a, for a web page or Wikipedia pages that, that are for a general audience. But obviously, the whole thing only makes sense if people then engage with it and add their own approaches and add references and so on. Yeah. So, so there's really a question to the community. Are people interested in that? Are people interested in contributing? And if we get positive feedback on, on, on that question, we may go to the effort of sort of setting this up initially and then hoping that everyone will contribute to it. That's all I wanted to, to add. Thanks. <laughs> I think Fabio is gone. <laughs> no, no. I'm oh, still here. And yeah, I could, don't worry. <laughs> I just uh, put myself out in order not to clutter the the screen. Okay. Thanks for um, for the for the additional information. I recall uh, Rome 204 actually, and uh, because also I'm a bit older. And uh, yes, so um, I don't think that there is any. Specific comment on that, even if there has been a big discussion about Brexit on the on the chat, <laughs> and uh, so so let me thank uh, Raiko and Gabi for the presentation, and uh, we will I think we can safely move without any coffee break, like uh, Timo was saying, directly to the first subsession, the one on nets and uh, big graphical systems.
Okay. Cool. Thanks for the time being. <laughs> Thanks for giving us that slot. So that was yeah. very Thank you. <laughs> Can you do, are you throwing us out now or how does it work? I will throw you out. Do not worry. <laughs> do, do. <laughs> Very well, and now we put uh, directly. <clears throat> oh, for some reason, Ike was still here. Now we have uh, uh, Blair who is there, right? Okay, very well. Let me kick out also Timo from. So, uh, Blair, can you hear me? Uh, yep, can you hear me? Blair, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Okay, very well. Okay. Sorry, uh, of course, what happened is that uh, we have, uh, I was having some, some trouble, so I will, uh, I switched uh, the, the, uh, uh, computer, but everything seems to be to be right uh, again, as or so I hope. Very well, and um, now, like I was saying, of course, uh, the title is on graph transformation, but there has always been strong tradition about any graph-like uh, visual formalism. In particular, the opening session is going to be about. Uh, um, Nets and conditional bigraphs. We uh, bigraphs are the, um, I can say, the invention of the late uh, Robin Miller, and they presented as a suited, uh, well suitable uh, model for uh, describing, in particular, uh, um, uh, calcul calculi with uh, name and value passing. But of course, since then, have been expanded as a full fledged. Uh, a meta framework. So the first two talks will be precisely on various extensions on the graphs. So, Blair, please go ahead. Great. Well, thank you very much, Fabio. So yes, uh, this talks about conditional bi graphs. So uh, unlike your sort of standard graph transformation systems, bi graphs have lacked application conditions uh, until now. So that this should be seen essentially the first step of bringing application conditions into bi graphs. Uh, because I'm assuming most people are probably more familiar with graph transformation systems rather than biographs. The first kind of half of the talk, I'll go over sort of what biographs are, and in particular, how matching is faces a decomposition problem, and how we can use that to implement a version of application conditions. And then I'll sort of, in the second half, just talk about some pain points that we've kind of solved by adding conditional rewrites to biographs. And then uh, just to sort of hit home the point, this is essentially the first step in this. We'll uh, have a couple of examples of things that we can't express that we really like to express. Uh, sort of looking forward. So bigraphs uh, are essentially graphical based uh, formalism for representing systems where you have essentially a strong spatial relationship between entities and then you may also have some non-spatial relationships. So kind of the, the key examples, things like cyber physical systems where you may have people that exist inside rooms, but then of course those people may have mobile phones and be able to talk or communicate with people in other rooms. But of course, this is very general, right? So you could have processes within some machine, and these processes can communicate with other processes. It may not be sort of locality based in the in the same place, so they're not in the same machine, but they're still talking. And sort of throughout this talk, you'll see that biographs have a very uh, process algebra vibe, uh, sort of based based on where they come from. There's a lot of theory about bias simulations and things that I won't go into. So essentially, I'll I'll use them as a systems modeling language, but just to let you know that there's a, a whole lot of theory 
if, if you're more interested in the kind of process calculi aspects. So here's an example of a biograph. So oh, first thing to notice, uh, essentially we have a set of entities. So we're going to draw them just as shapes uh, rather than just sort of plain graph nodes. So here we're saying this is an office entity, this is square. And within the office, so this is this notion of locality, we have these two circular entities, which we'll say are sensors. So this is maybe some form of cyber physical system. And then we have some entity representing a person inside this office. I'll talk a little bit about these dashed boxes in a second. And then what we can also say, and this is where this kind of process algebra aspect comes in, is that somewhere else in parallel, so these two dashed boxes are kind of parallel aspects of the system, uh, we have a hallway. And of course, in this, inside this hallway, we have uh, two more sensors. And th these can be arbitrarily nested. So if we kind of break this down, the kind of name by graph is because we have these two structures. So the first structure is displacement. So here we have these regions, these dash boxes we'll call regions. And we say inside region zero, we have an office. And inside the office, we have these uh, two sensors and the lady. And of course, we can break this down as much as we like. And again, I'll talk about this gray box in a second because it's, it's quite important. And then sort of the orthogonal structure is this linking structure where we take essentially hyper edges between uh, entities. One thing to notice is that entities have fixed arity. So sensors always have one link, but we'll see an example later where those links can just be disconnected. But we have to explicitly say that, that they have them. And again, we'll just talk about these na names in a little second. But of course, this is just a, a graph where we sort of remove all the location information and just tie together anything that's tied together. So essentially for the rest of the talk, we'll just use this this big notation at the top here. There's not much point in breaking it down into the two elements. So coming back to this kind of process calculi notion, uh, how we build biographs is uh, essentially compositionally. Uh, so rather than sort of just adding things onto hook points, uh, what we really want to do is say, this biograph may be in some larger context. And that's where these uh, grayed out rectangles come in. So the idea here is that we could splice another tree in here. So if I have uh, sort of maybe just this office again, then I could splice it into this gray rectangle by not this office, but a new office, adding it into the graph. So essentially, it, we can accept biographs from below. And then any other biograph that accepts two regions, we can splice this into. So we sort of build them out compositionally. And I'll show a lot of examples of that as we go through, because that's essentially the key uh, to doing the application conditions. Likewise, with names, it's exactly as you'd expect. A name below the biograph, we say, sort of comes from below. So this graph that goes in this site here. Uh, should have a name Y, an, uh, an outer name Y. So it's these outer names here, so that it can connect to this Y. And then we say this biograph gives out a name X. So hopefully that's relatively clear, but there's a lot of examples as we go through. And of course, that's essentially static biographs. And what we want to do is uh, work with dynamic rewrites. So what we do is we add a rewriting system on top. And it is fairly simple. So all we're trying to do is match a biograph with this shape and replace it with a biograph of this shape. So it's not quite transforming it. It's, you know, we, we literally rip this left-hand side out and replace it with this right-hand side. So this lady is not the same as this lady. It's it's essentially a copy, but, you know, you, you can think of it as, as just transforming it. So here we, we use this site essentially to say anything else can be here. So we're saying inside this office, there's there must be at least a lady and anything else. And then somewhere else in the system, so somewhere else in that place tree, there's a hallway which can have whatever it likes inside it including nothing. So we can always just add an empty biograph here. And then we're going to transform that. And of course, this works also with links. And you can also express rules where you have links and uh, place constraints. OK, and essentially, this brings us to the problem, which is you know, rewriting systems are powerful. Of course, you can express anything you like in them. But it, sometimes the, the intent of what you're trying to express isn't there because we can't do any non-local reasoning. So if we quickly look at here, we, there's no way of knowing sort of where this office is positioned. And maybe based on where that office is, maybe if it's in building one versus building two, you really want to do something different. So kind of a, a key example of this, it comes up quite often. So a, a lot of things we try and model currently with biographs, wireless sensor systems, and sort of some of the things you might want to do is take two sensors, let's say A and B here, and they may have some things inside them. Maybe these are links to other sensors. They could be MAC addresses, these kind of things. What we really want to do is say, take two sensors anywhere in the system. So we've got these two parallel regions. And what we'd like to do is add a link between them. And this kind of notion of nesting a, a linking entity and linking them this way just gets over these fixed arity constraints. 
Uh, but the problem is, because these sites can hide essentially anything in them, this link might already exist, okay? It could be inside these two sites. So what we really want to do is say, you know, I want this rule to fire as long as it doesn't create duplicate links. And essentially, in the current uh, biograph framework without conditional biographs, most of the time, what you end up doing is adding extra links, and you add a new rule that takes two links and replaces it with one link. But then, you know, you start cluttering transition systems if you're trying to do uh, analysis, which which isn't great or you end up adding lots of entities in order to tag and add a search routine, and it's a bit of a nightmare. And the real issue is that none of these really express the intent. What you really want is one rule that just says, I can do this so long as some conditions met. So that's what we've added. So these are essentially conditional biographs where we allow you to define a rule and then also say if, and in this case, we have a negative condition. So we're, we want this structure to not appear, some arbitrary biograph, and then this down arrow. So this is, also kind of an interesting part. So again, with things like GTS, you essentially have one context, which is not anything else. But here we have, you know, things that are below this bi graph, so inside these sites. And we also have an up arrow for things that are above this bi graph. Uh, and we'll see why this is necessary when we talk about how this is implemented, essentially. Okay, so the approach we want to do is take the existing matching framework, which is essentially a decomposition framework. So I'll, I'll show an example of how this works. But whenever I say matching, you can think decomposition. And so the, the key uh, reason for doing this is that we developed this tool biographer at the University of Glasgow, which has a very efficient uh, decomposition framework or matching framework. And we'd really like to try and reuse that as much as possible uh, in order to, to implement these application conditions without having to, to redo the entire matching framework. You know, there, there's quite a lot of constraints. It's quite fiddly. Uh, so it's, it's better to reuse what we can. Okay, so let's have a quick look at one of these uh, decompositions or how we do matching decomposition. So we have this sensor example again, sensor A and sensor B. And what we want to do is, so this is sort of a left-hand side of a rule. And what we want to do is match this in this bigger bi graph here. So the idea is that what we're trying to do is find some context. So things above the bi graph C, the match L itself and some parameter D uh, such that essentially this has been decomposed into this thing on the right-hand side here. So the match L is, of course, always the left-hand side. In the parameter, we need to add anything that's inside these sites. So let's say we match this A and this B. And then, of course, that A has to have at least one square inside it, or exactly one square inside it, since it's got exactly one in this, this graph here. The B must have exactly two squares inside it. And then this other A isn't in any of these sites, so it goes up to this context here. And the way of sort of reading these decompositions is you can imagine it kind of smashing itself up from D up to C. So anything in this region ends up in that site, anything in that region ends up in that site, and it sort of collapses in on itself. There's a little bit of uh, theory to allow names to pass between parameters and contexts. So we sort of add on this extra interface, but sort of for the purposes of the talk, it's not hugely important. So hopefully that's quite clear. The other way of looking at this, of course, is just to abstract away from the biographs completely and uh, look at sort of categorical semantics. So again, th this is why it's sort of different from your normal GTS application conditions. So in your sort of normal graph category, you're going to take the objects as graphs, and your arrows are these homomorphisms between the graphs, which you, know, you can think of as representing matches. Uh, whereas if, with bi graphs, what we're going to do is we're going to take interfaces as the objects. So that's you know how many of these dashed rectangles and filled dashed rectangles do we have? So, so how many things are we accepting from below, essentially, or giving to uh, from above? And then the name, same thing. What names are we accepting? What names are we giving? And then the arrows are going to be these these bi graphs uh, themselves. So, you know, a bi graph that doesn't accept anything but gives out one name would go from uh, some ground interface up to the the single name one region interface. Uh, composition is exactly what we said in the previous slide there. So we're just going to place the regions and sites, link the like names, and then we've got this essentially parallel uh, composition. So we're just going to put these two regions side by side. There, there's a little bit on the, the linking here, but it's not too important for the, the purposes of this talk. Okay, so with that in mind, we, we can throw out essentially all of those diagrams and just say, if we have some biograph A, so this is that 2A and 1B example uh, from the graphical slide, what we're trying to do is decompose into some context the match L and this parameter D. And here we're just saying you know, that D it isn't going to accept anything from below it. So it doesn't have any sites or any inner names. And then what we're saying is if that's the case, we can always replace that L with that R to create some new biograph A prime. And there's some notion of equivalence class here, but 
again, for this talk, it's not particularly important. And essentially, from this, so th this is the next step in order to get to the application conditions. And if you only take away essentially one thing from the talk, this is the, the key graphic. So what we're doing is we're kind of zooming in on this left-hand side here. And what we want to say is normally we take the A, decompose it into a context, the match L and the parameter D. And what we're going to allow is for that context to be decomposed again to look for some application condition P or some application condition below it, a P prime. So again, this is why we have this notion of down arrow, which is kind of says we're looking for the P prime here and up arrow that says we're looking for the P here. And one of the interesting things that we'll come back to quite a bit in essentially the limitations of this approach is that what we do is we allow these extra contexts here. So the application condition itself can have a context. And what that lets you do is have, essentially we can have a match that may have two regions in it, whereas we have an application condition that only has one region. And this uh, C prime prime is gonna allow us to essentially change the interface if we need to uh, by providing its own context. So that, that's really useful because when you're modeling, you don't really want your application conditions to need to match exactly the shape of, of your uh, match, but actually causes a lot of problems. And we'll see that when we look at the limitations. Okay, so I think I've said all of that. Uh, of course, if you're looking for a negative condition, you just want to say this decomposition doesn't exist. Okay, that's fine. And this is all possible in the existing matching framework. You know, we have the, the decompose call in Biographer, we just call it again. Uh, the last thing to say is just that the Biograph here can be arbitrary. So we're saying one region in these examples, but it can be as many regions as you like. They can also have sites. So it's just any Biograph, there's no, no conditions on what can go there. Okay, so let's take a couple of examples of things that we couldn't previously express very easily that we can now express pretty easy with conditional biographs. Uh, so trying to say things were unique was a bit of a pain. Um, so quite often, again, with sensor systems, they all have unique MAC addresses. And what you want to do is generate a bunch of them, but you never want to generate the same MAC address twice, because of course that can't happen in practice. Again, cyber physical systems, same issue. You don't want the same person to be in two places. That's of course, uh, it doesn't make any sense. So before conditional biographs, it wasn't a really good way of doing it. You'd have to somehow search through your entire graph and try and tag anyone that you've seen before. It's a bit of a nightmare. So with conditional biographs, it's fine. All you need to do is add on the sexual condition that says, you know, this biograph representing this unique entity is nowhere in the context. So even if this place is in a building with the unique entity, it, it doesn't, uh, this rule wouldn't apply. And it's nowhere inside these parameters. So if there's already a unique entity inside this site hiding, it doesn't apply. And I guess the important part here is that we've shown it is this one unique entity, but this can be, again, an arbitrary biograph. So if you want to avoid you, any form of unique structure, you can now do that. Other things that were a bit tricky. Uh, so, so, so sites are great, but they're a little bit powerful. So you can hide lots of things. So let's say we've got this biograph over on the left here. Uh, perhaps it's it's representing a Petrinet, since we're in the Petrinet session, with sort of two tokens of a particular color. So we say these circles are color. Well, that's fine. We can always just match exactly the two. But then maybe we've got sort of multicolored Petri nets where we now allow square colors. But what we really want is only to rewrite if we have these two circles, we can still do it. And we kind of want to ignore this square, right? So the common way of doing that is you add in this site here. Uh, so this square can essentially hide in this site. But the problem now is that also another circle can hide in this site. So if I want to match exactly two, well, there may actually be three here. There may be 50 here. It's possible to tell. So again, uh, with conditional biographs, it's actually very easy, right? We just have this extra condition that says we want to match exactly two, and there cannot be any circle hiding inside this site here. Again, very useful. Uh, sort of the current approach is probably to add extra entities that sort of wrap all the squares. So there's like a bag of squares, a bag of circles, and you end up uh, sort of just adding things to your model to do uh, control of rewrites rather than expressing the exact intent. So the idea of conditional biographs, we want to express the intent of exactly what we want. Okay, uh, another thing that's kind of tricky in biographs. So I, I know a lot of graph transformation systems have got sort of flow charts that allow you to define control with these kind of control structures. We don't have any of that in, in biographs. What we do have is uh, priority orderings. So sometimes we say, you know, all rules of priority one fire before rules of priority two, uh, which gets you so far, but it, it can get a little bit fiddly to, to allow things like just turn-based control. So here, here's a, a simple example of that. So let's say we have a controller and it says the current state. So these are maybe agents that we want to move around. And the idea is we want to say, if we're in the move state, we can apply these rules. So that's fine. All we need to do is say, 
if somewhere in the context we have this move state, we can apply this. So again, notice that we actually don't need to match that much. So this controller could live anywhere, so long as it's in the context of these places. You know, if it's inside the place, then this would have to be down. But anywhere outside these places, this controller can live, and we never need to match the whole controller move, just the move. And then we can also use conditions to essentially allow the controller to look inside everywhere else and say, you know, if someone's still not moved, then we can't apply this rule. But once everyone's moved, we're allowed to apply this rule and switch states. So just a quick little example. OK, so as I say, this is essentially a first version of application conditions for biographs. Where does it essentially fall over? And most of the issues are with this extra context. So this is the context of the application condition, not the context of the match. Yeah, so you can kind of imagine these two things are, are our parameter of the match here. So the problem is, let's say we've got these two sensors, but now we've managed to link A to itself with one of these link entities. Well, now this is an issue because if we look at the decomposition, what we could have is some context which puts this link, well, what we need to have in order to make this valid is a, a context that puts essentially these two links inside A, where we've essentially added this extra region uh, in order to to get the, uh, the shape right. But now the problem is, is that this application condition obviously exists, but it's not that there's a link between A and B, it's that there's a link within A. And really, because we don't have any control over this C prime, uh, that rule won't apply where we, we really do want it to apply. Uh, most of the time, this isn't really an issue. You control that at, at the model level, right? You just don't allow internal links between an A or you give them their own type. But it, it's interesting to, to consider that's an issue. Uh, I guess, essentially, what, what we really want to be able to express is essentially to name these locations, say 0 and 1, and say, you know, this link must be with one square inside site 0 and one square within site 1. It gets a little bit tricky, uh, particularly with the stuff we do at Glasgow, because we work with biographs of sharing, where that uh, locality uh, forest is actually a DAG, so we allow entities to have two parents. And of course, we'd want something to do the same with uh, context, so we can say, you know, D is somehow above uh, the C here, it's not above this this other circle. And I guess the biggest pain point is actually that names don't work as you'd expect them to. So th th this is where it's it gets very tricky. So if you look at this rule, you want to say, you know, we have some node connected to X and uh, we can transform it into this red node connected to X. If, you know, there's a square connected to X in the context. And if you just read this, what you'd expect to happen is, you know, you would match, if you've got this one, it can go red and this one can't because it's not connected to a square. However, actually, if you look at the decomposition where we match this circle down here, then because again, we have these parameters and context of the application conditions, what we can do is match that square, have essentially the, the context change the x for the y. That's a perfectly valid thing to do so that we've got this y here. But then again, in the application condition, we can, of course, have another square connected to an x, which is then renamed to the z elsewhere. So again, uh, this, this will allow this to go red when obviously when you read the rule, that doesn't seem to be the intent that you like. So again, there's sort of too much flexibility. There's no way of tracing this x to this x. So these are the kind of things we'd like to work on. So the, the final thing is, of course, uh, nested conditions are, are sort of a hot topic at the moment, and we, we don't really have a great story for them. So let, let's say we wanted this to be some form of nested condition. So sort of assume there's some new syntax. So it's not that we want two squares, it's that we want to match one and then the other. Uh, so not the same square twice. So sort of the, the obvious decomposition, this seems to work, right? So we take the L, uh, this, this circle here, and then we have an application condition that matches this first square. And then in the context, we have everything else. And of course, there's a square there. So that looks like it works. But again, there's no way of controlling that that's the decomposition order. And another perfectly valid decomposition is to have the L. And then essentially, our application condition matches the outside square, whereas now the second square is inside the context. So if you look at this rule, this arrow is, of course, now the wrong way around. So we, we now have this ordering effect where it really matters if we, if we do this or this starts mattering. Yeah, so that, that makes it very tricky to sort of extend into the, the nested semantics uh, as is. Of course, if we add uh, different matching semantics, then we can we can start looking at these things. OK, so just to kind of summarize and look a bit towards the future, uh, if we want this more expressivity in order to express these things that we mentioned, we, we really need sort of a new or a modified matching alg algorithm that really lets us do things like trace the names 
through decompositions. You know, matching on these names is is really a pain point because it, if you read the rule, it looks like it does something different. I mean, oh, when you have a modeling formalism where it looks like the rule does one thing and it doesn't, it, it's it's not great. Uh, so things like forcing decomposition orders also important. Some things we're maybe looking at is things like spatial logic. So there is bilog for bigraphs, which is a kind of full blown spatial logic, but we think it may be a little bit too powerful and it's kind of hard to to prove that that your uh, statements terminate. So we're maybe thinking something like spatial logic of closure spaces and using that in order to force things into particular locations. And then of course, exploring nested conditions. So there's a, there's been a little bit of work on nested conditions from a reactive systems viewpoint and bygraphs fit into that reactive systems view. Uh, so we hope to kind of take advantage of some of that. Uh, again, ho hopefully maybe for the, the special issue. Okay, so just to, to wrap up there. So we've managed to add essentially basic application conditions to bigraphs and th they're actually very useful. Uh, so in sort of day-to-day -day modeling, we, we sort of see them uh, coming up all the time, but there's still a, quite a bit of work to do in order to capture some other common patterns. In particular, this this kind of name matching uh, is, is something that's uh, re really a pain point. So again, if you have to take away one thing, then this is diagram instead of just doing breaking down A into some context, the match and the parameter, what we're going to allow is to break down these parameters again and the context again. And uh, I, guess, I didn't say first, but of course you can break this down multiple ways. So if you have multiple application conditions, it's just uh, different contexts, different parameters and different conditions there. And I think that's everything. So thank you very much. If there's any questions. Yes, indeed. Uh, if there is any chance, I see that there is one just now. Let me see if it if it's not too too large. And this is Baraiko. Blair, can you see the question? Uh, no, let me come back out and think. It say, is there any way to see the condition as a bigraph extend in the left hand side? that may or may not be allowed to match, depending on whatever it is negative or not? Um, possibly. So I, I, again, it's, I, if I understand the question right, it is essentially enforcing the, the shape of those contexts so that instead of having the context, you sort of have an extension of this L that, that subsumes that context, I guess, is what I think it is. So I, I guess um, in, in that sense, that's what we're we're looking into, but we don't really have a good story, if if that's what you meant. Yeah. I think yes. Anyhow, Raiko can further comment. I for uh, as for myself, I'm um, thank you very much for the time being for the um, uh, nice overview of the of your uh, extension to the to the biograph framework. Uh, did you try also some of the classical uh, calculus, like uh, you mentioned in spatial logic, but did you did you do something concerning um, the some calcula like mobile ambience and so on, where the notion of uh, uh, conditions about nesting is actually quite strong, or some of these kind of uh, calculi? So we we haven't in the examples. We we kind of came at more of a kind of systems modeling, but that's something we we do want to do because of course bigraphs have this very sort of calculi meta modeling language sort mm -hmm. of side to them as well as systems modeling. Uh, so that that's something we really want to do and see how uh, you can do things. But perhaps you could even express mm -hmm. name, name, name restriction and such. So I have a couple of of question then uh, more question than I have to to cut. The discussion. I'm sorry, I'm going to the, to the next one, but the first one is by Barbara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, basically, a question about the types of conditional related. There is uh, there has been a lot of work, as you know, on uh, uh, application condition and nested application condition, and so Barbara is basically pointing to um, yeah. To so the, 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 this is again something that we're we're trying to look into to see how this kind of more general nested conditions inside or, or conditions general inside the reactive systems framework uh, can be brought over. And, and we did briefly explore it, but we haven't found kind of the direct relation yet. Uh, so it is possible that some of this stuff can can sort of go back the other way and that we can bring stuff in from, from that paper. But we, 
we haven't quite had enough time to to dig into the the core details. So it's thank you very much. And then there is a final question by Marina. Then we will have to switch to the uh, next uh, talk. I see that Mark is already ready there, and this is yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so so in terms of the, the special flavors, as you know. What, what, what was that? Sorry. Uh, what kind of special logic are you going to consider? The Cardelli Gordon uh, one. There have been a few proposals in the last few years, and so Marina is just asking about yeah. which kind of logic you are you are thinking about. So we're we're not necessarily set on on any of them yet. Uh, the the one that we were kind of originally kind of thinking about is just spatial logic of closure spaces. So there's been some other biograph work that's kind of used that. Uh, a, a little bit so we were thinking that may be a good place to start and then obviously if we need to be able to express more we'll, we'll kind of look at more expressive logics uh, but even just some notion of reachability that we could use for names would be would be quite handy very well thanks again for the presentation for the overview then i will uh, simply try to see if i can insert uh, marco in the loop. Thanks again, Blair. And thank you. Bye. Please switch off the the sharing. Thanks. Very well, Marco. Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, no. Okay, very well. Sorry for the little uh, technical uh, glitch, which seems to to keep on going. Let's see if I can share. Oh, if I can now. Please go ahead, share your screen, and put the slides on uh, on presentation mode. Very well. So uh, we have Marco Peressotti, is actually from the University of uh, Southern Denmark, but uh, it seems that there is a strong connection with uh, Udine still. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, the people of Udine with uh, Marino at the start have been working quite a lot on, uh, on uh, biographs. Here they are uh, taking a specific flavor of biographs, which are the direct once and Mark will for sure tell us uh, something more about that and he will tell us about how to actually calculate uh, how the embedding of a match works. Right Marco? Please go yep. ahead. Thanks, thanks for the introduction and also thanks to Blair for the nice uh, overview and introduction on Bytos, which was very thorough and is going to save some time in my presentation, so thanks again. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Alessio Chiaperini, a student from the University of Udine, and Professor Marino Mikulan. And uh, essentially, it's about uh, how to compute embeddings for directed bigraphs. And uh, we already heard a lot about uh, bigraphs, and they started in 2003, introduced by Milner. And their main, uh, let's say, traction, especially in the recent rediscovery in the system modeling community, has been that they are a very flexible method model and as we have seen, there are plenty of ways to extend them, to adapt them uh, very, let's say, easily and conveniently. And they have an immediate graphical presentation and a solid mathematical foundation. Also, there are several tools like generic libraries like Biographer or uh, JBIG, that are model checkers, simulators, editors, and more. And uh, the, among those extensions uh, are directed biographs, which were introduced in 2007 by David Groman and Marino Mikula, mm -hmm. uh, as an extension, a strict generalization of Milner's undirected biographs. And the idea essentially is that now links are uh, directed, they have a direction, there are some other details in the extension that I'm going to cover uh, briefly in the next slide. But the reason behind this extension is essentially that they are uh, well suited for modeling dependencies and uh, request flows. In fact, um, there are the application of direct uh, biographs started in molecular biology and uh, verification of security protocols. And in the last uh, three, four years, there have been new application 
in the modeling of container-based system, like uh, modeling and verification framework for Docker, Docker Compose, or other uh, models for uh, cloud systems in general. The shortcoming of the record biographs is that so far there isn't a, an implementation, and the main uh, technical um, uh, contribution that is required by uh, many of these tools is actually a way to compute uh, biograph embeddings or uh, bi biograph matching, but you can piggyback matchings over embeddings or just make a couple of uh, tweaks in uh, our model to add some uh, symmetry breaking and re recover directly. Uh, matching side. I'm going to discuss about this later. So essentially our contribution is uh, to give a way to compute these embeddings and uh, implement it in a library in order to allow it to be incorporated in existing tools instead of try to yet again fragment even more the um, landscape of tools in the community. So very short introduction. We already have seen a lot of details about uh, biographs. And uh, direct biographs, I was saying, essentially add this uh, direction on the link graph. And uh, now, because of the direction, the set of names in the interfaces, the inner and outer interfaces, are now split into outgoing names, which are, uh, are given a polarity. Usually, they are given a positive polarity. And ingoing names, so in the opposite direction, that, and have the negative polarity. You can think of this as having actually two uh, classical link graphs where one is with, is with uh, by 180 degrees. The rest of the definition is essentially the same and the one you have seen so far. And uh, as an example, here is a writing rule. And uh, in order to apply these writing rules, in the previous presentation, we have seen it as a, presented in terms of decomposition. But uh, again, this can be just uh, interpreted as finding an embedding for this structure in our um, biograph, our directed biograph, and then transform it by applying these writing rules. But there are other ways to manipulate biographs. For instance, there are edit scripts that rely as a starting point on uh, embeddings instead of the compositions by matching. And also having an embedding allows you to identify the correspondence between uh, elements of your edX with uh, your uh, graph you are uh, manipulating and transforming. And this allows to apply techniques like refocusing in order to uh, get better performance in your writing system. This is also one of the main reasons why we are targeting embeddings instead of uh, matching and the composition. So about the complexity of the problem, this has been uh, proved to be NP-complete in 2008 by uh, Giorgio Bazzi, Marino Miculan, and Romeo Rizzi. They actually focused on uh, a part of the problem that is the embedding of a place graph. And this is already NP-complete. On top of that, we need to compute uh, the embedding of the link graph. And for a certain class of uh, bigraphs, which is covered more or less all the cases you need when you are doing uh, system modeling for agents or uh, modeling of process calculi like uh, PyCalculus or the ambient calculus, this is actually covered in this class, so there is a way to extend a solution for the place graph embedding problem to a solution for the whole biograph embedding problem in linear time. But the hard part is getting the place graph in the begin to begin with. Then by a direct corollary of this, we get that many flavors of biograph have that the, embedding, the associated embedding problem is NP-complete. This also justifies our approach, that is to, instead of deriving a direct algorithm customized for uh, the embedding of direct biographs, produce a reduction to another NP-complete uh, problem that is an integer flow admissibility problem. And one of the reasons behind this is we gain a lot of flexibility. And we can piggyback on the improvement of the encoding and the underlying solver. And this is something that is especially critical given that the uh, development of the associated library is going to be carried out in academic, an academic setting. So what is this uh, reduction to a multi-flow admissibility problem? And what is a multi-flow admissibility problem? Essentially, in a flow admissibility problem, you define a network, so a graph with connection. You have some nodes that are designed as sources that are going to emit some flux of uh, some unit of flux over the network. And then you have some uh, sinks or target 
and you want to see if there is a, there are, and there are some constraints over how units can flow over the network. And then you want to see if there is a, actually a flow that satisfies these constraints, or you want to find a, a way to direct your flow that maximizes some reward function. And how we start by mod creating this uh, flow network is that we take our uh, link graph for the host the biograph we want to find an embedding into, and we lay it down and using an horizontal uh, alignment instead of the vertical one as it was in the previous slides. And um, on the left part of the screen, we have the points of the biograph, which are the inner interfaces, like uh, the inner names of the biograph and the ports that are the anchor points where a link of the line, the link graph can attach to a node of the place graph. And this is the interface that allows the two structures to interchange, to talk to each other essentially. So this is our, on the, this side then, this is, is exactly the hypergraph of the linking. And on the other side, we have the handles that are the names in the outer interface and some uh, anchor points inside the biograph that are called edges. Then uh, we associate some uh, outputs. So every inner point is going to be uh, a source producing exactly one unit. And uh, we can already cover the shape of our graph as a flow over this network. And in this case, there is exactly one possible flow. And on the side of the sinks, we want to get exactly the hierarchy, the number of uh, expected unit flow is going as to match the number of uh, points that are attached to that link. So for instance, in this case, there is exactly one point. So we expect to receive one unit of flow. In this case, we expect two and in this case, a zero. For the guest uh, link graph, we obtain uh, some other connection in our network and some other points. These are going to be internal points of the network. They're not uh, uh, sinks or sources. They will receive flow and provide flow with some new connection we're going to add in a moment. And again, on the left side of the screen, we have the inner interface of the guest. And on the right side, we have the outer interface of the guest. And we have some constraints on this. Here, we have a constraint that uh, if this node corresponds to a port, so a, a connection to the place graph. This has to have exactly one unit of flow because it, this guarantees that it has to match with exactly a port on the other, on the, on the host. Otherwise, uh, the notion of uh, embedding, but also the notion of matching would allow you to combine, for instance, these two points using the um, part of the, uh, the arguments the T in the decomposition and uh, steer it toward the same inner point of the, the same inner name of the uh, guest uh, biograph. And I keep saying biograph because it's saying directed biographs is a bit long, but you get it. And um, for, por for points that are not ports, we have a, a bit laxer uh, constraint that says you are going to receive at least one unit of flow. That means you are going to be matched to something either uh, something of, from the inner interface or something from the, um, inner, the interfaces that are introduced by the composition. There are no constraints on the outer, inter outer points, uh, sorry, on the handles and the outer interface because those are going to receive exactly the flow from the other part, from the uh, left part of the graph. And uh, of course, there are the usual constraints about flow preservation. And since this is a multi-flow admissibility problem, we want to keep the flows separate because we want uh, that each source eventually will get uh, to its uh, associated sink. We don't want to somehow have this point to go through this link and then be associated to a different uh, point in the structure of the guest, of the host biograph. So how does it work uh, and how do we connect these two parts of the network. Well, we add uh, uh, variables that, are, uh, sorry, we have uh, we add edges in the network that connect each point, uh, each source on the host with a source in the guest and each uh, handle in the guest with a sink in the host. And by doing this detour 
through the network of the guest, we are uh, essentially saying that this uh, hyper edge here is going to be in the image of this hyper edge in the guest link. So we are saying that this hyper edge is embedded as this one. And uh, now if we have that the constraint is preserved and if we proceed and try to assign the other points, now we are violating the constraint. So here we need to find another solution. And the only way to satisfy also the last constraint is to have this flow over the network. And now you can see that by just looking at the hurdle that the edges that we are using that are crossing from the top part of the network to the lower part of the network and back, we get exactly the mapping from the structure of the guest into the structure of the host. So to summarize how you build this uh, network, essentially, as you said, you lay down as, as part of your network the linking of the uh, guest. Uh, I forgot the linking of the host on top here. And then for each point, you have a uh, Net, um, an, uh, link in the network that goes to every possible match as a point down here. Now, this is a general construction. So given a guest and a link graph, then you just need to uh, build this uh, network with we call the LGE. And uh, as I said, the points of the host have other as sources with capacity exactly one, the handles are sinks. And, uh, points of the and handles of the guests are going to be internal nodes and there are connection between them that uh, are given by the stars of the upper edge. Then there are some usual uh, constraints about the, fl the flux and uh, the separation of the flux. But still, this is an instance of a multi-flow admissibility problem. And uh, um, what we show in the paper is that this is actually an adequate model, an adequate reduction for uh, the original pro embedding problem for link graphs is actually sound and complete because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between solution to these problems. So admissible flows are the way you can select these edges in order to build this uh, flow across your network and uh, embeddings of uh, your given graph, uh, link graph G into the given link graph H. And uh, there is a similar um, model for the place graph. Uh, there are some, um, the role of the guest and the, and the host is switched in the sense that the, uh, the elements, the size and leaf in the structure of the guest are going to be sources, but more or less the gist of the design is essentially the same of what I've shown you right now. And why we switched, uh, the reason was essentially because of uh, the um, arguments you can put inside. And this, this switch made the encoding a little bit more compact. And uh, now we can leverage the orthogonality of uh, the definition of pi graphs being the or composition of these two structures that share um, nodes of the place in order to interact and, and just combine the um, the set of constraints that define your uh, flow network for uh, the link graph and the set of constraints that define your flow network for the place graph, or directly the network if you want to reason in terms of graphs. And on top of that, we need to add some consistency, consistency constraints. And those are what you would expect, meaning that if you um, embed an, a port of the guest in a, in a specific port of the host, you also need the uh, node that is attached to that port to be embedded in the node, in the corresponding nodes attached to the corresponding port in the guest, uh, in the host graph. So, and actually there are like three constraints you need to add to, to the problem in order to be able to combine these two. And again, we get the, our uh, soundness completeness uh, result so that we can recover every embedding as a instance, as a solution of these uh, multi-flow admissibility problem. And uh, we made an implementation of this since that was our motivating, uh, our, our, the main reason behind this work. We started from an existing library that is JLibig, is an open source Java library for modeling undirected biographs. And on top of that, we extended it with uh, support for uh, 
uh, representation of directed digraphs and implemented exact weighted and approximated embeddings. The last, the exact part is what I've just described right now. The weighted and approximated embeddings was a bonus we got since we are using this approach based on constraint programming because from now we can turn instead of a, to a miscibility problem to an optimization problem and find, for instance, uh, embeddings where instead of, I don't know, uh, a specific sensor, you are allowed to use another sensor, uh, another device uh, paying a price for it. So you say, okay, this is not the best solution, but uh, since there isn't any, I'm going with that. As a backbone for our constraint solving, we use the Choco, which is a standard uh, um, library for constraint programming in Java. And um, starting on this, on top of the JDBig, in order to validate our design and implementation, we built a simulator for writing system based on uh, directed biographs. And as, a, as an experiment, we run a writing system that was modeling a fleet of cars moving over a network. And uh, we measure the cost on time of preparation, resolution, and update of uh, your, the state of your writing system based uh, on uh, using this uh, approach, this implementation, and then classify them as increasing uh, simulation sizes. So as a first uh, result, in this graph, you can see how the time is uh, split in between the writing phase. Of, actually, they're not ordered uh, by time. So in the building phase of the uh, constraint satisfaction problem, the resolution, how you build the, embed, the actual embedding, the representation uh, in, the, in the Java library of the embedding, started from the numerical solution you get out of the solver, and then the actual rewriting step. And in this graph, you have that the size of the network, the size of the map, the, row, the fleet of cars can roam, uh, is fixed. And instead, we are increasing the size of the, the fleet. And uh, all the examples are randomly generated. And the time you see is the time for the total, uh, for every write, uh, every transition in the system. So it's not the time used to uh, compute just one transition or one embedding is the total cost of the simulation. And you can see that the major part is going to be spent in the, the, the solution and the reading of the solution phase. And uh, in that, there is that, uh, and this is something that should have been reported in uh, this graph now that I realize it. Part of this is motivated by the uh, increasing number of solutions you find. That's why there is this linear um, increment in the total time that is correlated with the number of cars. And in fact, in this uh, other example, we have the size of the fleet of cars that is fixed. And instead, we are increasing the network. But since the number of cars are limited, and uh, the transition they can do is just moving to an adjacent node in the network to model that they are moving on a street, then the number of solutions is actually pretty stable over time since it's bound on the number of uh, the cars. And this allows that uh, there is a correlation in the yellow part between actually the number that's the number of solution. And this is, uh, give us justification to my observation that here there is this increment on the yellow part because I'm getting more solution. Instead, here there is uh, an increment on the time spent on solving the problem uh, exactly because we are building a bigger constraint satisfaction problem, a builder network, because of the bigger map the uh, fleet is moving on. And one of the reason, one of the things that uh, we are planning to do in order to try to minimize this is to try and have a more local and focused uh, modeling of the system that actually can uh, uh, omit part of the network that are, uh, we are building, so get a smaller, more more compact the representation of the problem. So to conclude, uh, our contribution was to define a reduction of the directed biograph embedding problem to a flow admissibility problem. We gave an implementation in JDBig, and thanks to some of the facilities offered by the libraries that allows you, for instance, to label biographs and extend them without having to implement uh, re-implement all the machinery in the library, we were able to support also weighted and approximated embeddings uh, as optimal flows instead. There are many things we want to investigate in the future. First is the integration of uh, 
our um, embedding uh, algorithm in existing tools. We already have a prototype on the simulation side. We are looking about uh, on, on uh, about having other implementation on model checking and other logic on top of it. The other thing that I mentioned uh, discussing uh, about the why we were we were preferring embeddings instead of matching is that. Uh, with embeddings, you can actually do refocusing. And right now, it's not supported in the library and is in the next thing on our to-do list. And uh, as well, there are some optimization we are exploring about uh, how to get a bit more efficient on certain families of uh, guests we want to embed. Because in practical application, usually your guests are fixed and known a priori. And the problem itself is fixed parameter tractable. And the parameter is the width, the number of uh, regions you have in your guest. So we are exploring ways to leverage this uh, property of the complexity of this problem in order to get better uh, approximations, better, better um, performance in the implementation. And finally, although we started having these weighted and approximated embeddings, they were, these are an experimental feature dictated by an opportunity in the implementation, but we are lacking a thorough study of the theory behind these uh, uh, a new kind of embeddings and how the usual properties you would expect from a um, biographical rewriting system are affected or, or not by this new way of doing uh, rewritings. And uh, with that, I conclude and I thank you again for your attention. <clears throat> Very well, thanks, Marco. Um, I don't know if there are any any question on the stream? Anyhow, I have a, I have a curiosity. Uh, since you mentioned families for optimization, but do you have in mind some um, uh, interesting case studies? Be, I mean, besides developing the <laughs> the theory, do you have in mind some interesting family of possible case studies uh, that would fit in these um, uh, families of uh, shapes that you mentioned? Well. Uh, about the the parameter I was mentioning, the parameter is actually the number of uh, dotted regions you have in your guest. That's essentially it. And in uh, the kind of writing systems I've seen so far for pie graphs, usually you uh, get a couple of those. When you get three or four, you are doing something unusual. So being able to try to use this, since this is the parameter that is getting UMP completeness, is the one that is making the general solution explode, then try to specialize instead your algorithm for a specific parameter. So let's say I want to do an algorithm that can handle only two of these boxes, two regions, then I already get covered a lot of applications. Because for instance, the modeling of uh, the um, ambient calculus or the pi calculus I think only requires rules with one or two regions. Okay, fine, I understand. Uh, we have a question. Let me put this one uh, uh, online. It's so tricky. Okay, so this is Sharon. We say that speaking as a constrained programmer, we have various ways of outputting equivalence classes of solution rather than explicitly enumerating them. Would this be helpful in this application? Uh, yes, indeed, especially if you want to use our model uh, to compute uh, matchings instead of embeddings. Because for embeddings, there are many symmetries that are not relevant for uh, matches because you just do the decomposition. But if you are doing embeddings, especially if you want to do stochastic modeling or stochastic rewriting system with your biographs, you want to keep the identity of the image you have in order to do the refocusing, or especially, or if you want to do some Gillespie simulation, you want to keep track of this information. So in that, sen in that setting, I don't want to break symmetries. But if I don't care about this information, then of course, it would be really helpful and it's going to uh, cut out a lot of uh, uh, instances that instead are not useful. I see. OK. I, I, I think I want to know a bit more about this. <laughs> Thanks for the. Very useful uh, comment. Very well, and you can see Charan. We have the address of Charan in the in the web page for the for the conference. Fine, Thank thanks. You.
Thanks, Marco, for the time being. And um, now we will pass to last but not least uh, to, to Fabrizio Genovese. I'm Hello. adding him to the stream and I'm taking you, you out. And uh, very well, the, should, everything should disappear. Now I'm also adding the, the, the screen, yes. Yeah. The, the slides very well. So now we are something compl completely different, like the Monty Python would say, actually not really. Eh? Like I said, there have been a lot of work uh, in the graph transformation community about various uh, graph life formalists, but of course, uh, the how can I say, it? maybe the most classical one is uh, Petrinets, and there has been a lot of work on this since at least um, various categorical representations since at least uh, the mid 80s. But I think that Fabrizio and David have a different twist on uh, that. So please, Fabrizio, it's up to you now. Okay, uh, so this is joint work with David Spivak from MIT. And I mean, we are mainly working in applied category theory at the moment, which means we take categorical gadgets and try to figure out how they can be useful in other things. And basically, the core of this work is to notice that a very um, common categorical gadget called uh, Cretinic construction uh, can be uh, useful to uh, model some let's say, I think, well-known uh, kind of results in um, Petronet theory. So uh, I'll start from the very, very beginning. So I guess, I mean, everyone knows what a Petronet is. In case you don't, uh, it's just a thing where you have places uh, that represent resource types, transitions that represent processes turning resources into other resources and tokens that are inhabiting places and they basically flow around as transitions prescribed. Practically, this is a Petronet, the round things uh, are places, the dots, uh, black dots are tokens and the squares are transitions. And we have these arcs that basically say uh, how much uh, tokens, how many tokens are consumed or produced by a transition. So in this case, I can fire the new transition and you see that I output two tokens in X and Z, taking one from Y, and then I can fire the new transition or actually the tau that consumes two and produce, produces one in Y. Okay, cool. So uh, a very common generalization of this thing is what is called a guarded or colored patronet. Uh, these are basically an extension of patronets where we have tokens uh, that are not just black dots, but they, they carry properties around with them. So these properties are also called colors. Um, then transitions inputs uh, are endowed with gods that are basically conditions saying uh, which kind of tokens can be consumed. So you, you could ask like, I, I want to consume one red token and two uh, yellow tokens, for instance. Uh, similarly, transition outputs now specify the properties for the tokens. Uh, and the language of gods and properties is somehow arbitrary in the sense that you, you, you can, you know, uh, require these gods and um, outputs to be decorated with formulas in whatever theory you want that can be very simple or very complicated. Uh, I think that maybe here the main discriminant is your application and how computationally friendly you want your nets to be. So this is an example of a colored net. Uh, you see, I mean, if you're colorblind, actually you don't, but I hope you're not. Uh, in any case, uh, I basically have red dots, uh, black dots, yellow dots, and blue dots going around. And so in this place, in the um, up uh, right, I have a red dot. And now this transition in the right side is consuming a red dot and um, spitting back a black dot and a blue dot. So if I apply it, this is what happens. And now I can apply, you see, even if I have two tokens now on the left, the transition in uh, the top left cannot fire because I don't have any red tokens in, in there. Uh, but I can fire the one in uh, the bottom uh, left 
uh, I am not decorating this uh, arc here, which means any token uh, is okay. And so if I fire it, I get a yellow token. Cool. So our goal is to describe these nets categorically. And in particular, I want to get a categorical description of this idea that if your guard logic is, let's say, friendly enough, then you can translate a gutter net back to a classic kind of net. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, basically, we rely on a, a very long established result that says that, you know, there's a link between patronets and free symmetric strict monologue categories. So, to which patronet corresponds a free symmetric strict monologue category defined as follows. I use the places of the net to generate objects, I use transitions to generate morphisms, and now um, the objects of this category are basically representing markings, that is, as token assignments on the net. So an object of type A tensor A tensor B means that I have two tokens in A and one token in B, and morphisms correspond to a sequence of transition firings in our net. So this is uh, an example. Uh, you see that I have transition T, uh, B, and U, and I'm using them to generate morphisms in this category. So T will be a morphism of type P1 to P2, because those are the input and output places of T. Um, B, on the contrary, will go from P2 to P3, P4. Uh, and you will go from P3 to P4. And so you see that this sequence of transition firings that I have uh, here in the net uh, can be represented with this string diagram here, where I first apply T, then apply B, and then U. And you see that I can also do bookkeeping by basically using uh, the symmetries in a monogal category to rearrange um, the, the, the tokens in, in this string diagram. Uh, clearly, the good thing about this is that um, there are many inequivalent string diagrams that represent the same transition firing in the net. This is because uh, basically string diagrams distinguish between tokens. So you see that in this string diagram in particular, I have two tokens in P3 and I'm deciding to apply U to one of the two, and now these two tokens are actually different. I have two tokens in P4 uh, in the, at the end of the string diagram, and clearly they have different histories, so that they can be kept distinguished. Um, this is especially useful if, like we do in many state box, the startup I work for, uh, you basically want to use patterns to orchestrate um, you know, programs, applications. And so in this case, if you know, uh, the type P3 actually represents the type of bank accounts, I better distinguish these two tokens because if I'm doing a withdraw, I want to be sure that I'm withdrawing from the right bank account. Uh, okay, so uh, what is the idea? The idea is that uh, given a free symmetric strict model category and any other symmetric model category S, uh, a map from the generating objects and morphisms of FM to S is enough to fully specify a monolog factor. This is because the composition in free, uh, the free category is defined free. So as long as you say where morphisms and generating morphisms and objects go, everything else follows automatically. Um, so we can define a patronet with this S semantics as a pair uh, N and sharp, where N is the net and N sharp is the semantics. So a, func a functor from the free category generated by the net to our semantic category S. Yes. Uh, and a morphism of uh, nets with S semantics is just a strict monodal functor uh, from uh, one net, one free category to the other that commutes with the semantic assignment. This is consistent with the fact that uh, functors between free categories satisfying some properties are actually the right definition of morphism. They really capture the idea of morphism of patronets being lifted to morphism of uh, free categories. In here, I am allowing any functor, uh, and this is, if you, if you go in the paper, this is because we also try to glue nets together and do stuff like that, and this is the right notion of morphisms with respect to the application we have in mind. But it's not really important if F has or not some um, properties uh, here. 
aside of being strict monoidal. That's the only thing we, we required. Um, okay, so we can consider this category of patroness with the semantics, cool. Uh, and now we specialize the semantics. So we have two different semantics we are uh, taking into consideration. One is um, set uh, dots that are basically uh, sets and partial functions. So sets are my objects and partial functions are between them are my morphisms. And the other one is span. Um, span is basically a sort of uh, proof relevant version of relations. So a span is just a set with two maps to two other sets and you say that the span from A to B is this sort of diagram and the tip is giving you all the witnesses that map stuff in A to stuff in B. Uh, these categories are actually by categories but we are considering the strictified version of them um, and yeah so that's it uh, and then we define the garden net as an object of Petri set dot. So it's basically a Petri with a semantic in partial functions. And a garden net with side effects is an object of Petri span. Uh, morphisms uh, for a garden net with side effects or not are defined as in the previous slides. So they are just like functors of big stuff to mute. Um, okay, so what does it mean? Why is this nice and blah blah blah? Uh, well, uh, in uh, the semantics, uh, partial function semantics, uh, a transition corresponds to a fun partial functions that tell us how properties of tokens are mapped. The properties of tokens are basically the sets we are mapping uh, places to. So this is an example. I have this net down here uh, and I'm mapping uh, the first place on the left to a set with two colors. So we are saying this place, can, you can only have tokens that have property blue or red. In the middle place, you can have tokens that have property being green or yellow. And in the last place, you have tokens having property being one of these colors that don't have a definite name. So these this three things here. Um, and the transitions now are partial functions. So you see, they are saying if you have a red token, for instance, map it to a green one. If you have a green token, then you can't do nothing because this second transition on the right doesn't accept green tokens. Uh, and you know, if you have a yellow one, you send it to this other red-ish thing here. Uh, and you see that now with this semantics, we are capturing both the God kind of thing. So we are deciding which tokens are accepted and which are not. And the output condition thing, where we basically rewrite the color of the token um, when we map it to our output places. Okay, so um, this is basically it. Uh, and if you go to the span case instead, it's very similar, but now you see that we are allow, allowing also different paths between the same two tokens. So for instance, I have these two paths named S2 and S3 here, that are telling me that there, I have two ways of mapping the red token to the green token. Uh, this is basically uh, modeling side effects in the sense that one way to see it is that this transition uh, is not just taking into consideration what happens on the net, but it's taking into consideration side effects. So maybe uh, some external uh, input by a user or some state uh, that basically is telling you which one of these paths you have to use when you have more than one. Okay, so uh, now we present this thing called written deconstruction. We are actually using a dumbed down version of it called the category of elements, uh, but we kept the name written deconstruction because it's obviously cooler. Um, so uh, what is the idea? The idea is that if I have a function from C to D categories, uh, and uh, the objects in D are basically sets, then I can, so I have a notion of element in, in the objects of D, then I can define this integral F thing uh, as a category having as objects, pairs, C, X, where C is an object of C and X is in F of X. So X is in the image of the object C in D. And a morphism at this point is just a morphism in the category C so that X gets sent to Y when I apply the functor to this morphism. 
Um, so what is the point? The main theorem of our work is that if C is a free symmetric strict model of category and F is a strict model functor to either set, star or span, then integral of F, so the Gertrude construction on F, is itself a free symmetric strict model of category. Now, this is important because since we are identifying free symmetric strict model categories with Petronets, this is basically telling you that if you do the Gritten deconstruction on uh, one of these functors, what you get is still a Petronet. It's still something that is, you know, comes from a Petronet because it's a free symmetric strict model category. So in practice, what are we doing is the following. Imagine that we have this net with the semantics here on the left. Uh, the gradient deconstruction is a way to internalize this semantics in the net itself. So from here, performing the gradient deconstruction, we have the thing on the right where down here we have our former net um, and up here these sort of places in balloons kind of thing. That is our new net. So this is the great the net coming from the great deconstruction. So you see that before we have, for instance, one place uh, on the left and two tokens corresponding to this place, and now we are saying that places are couples place x with x in f of x. So in this case, the places that the, these token types up uh, on the left get promoted to places of the new net on the right. Similarly, for these uh, transitions, uh, each one of these transitions corresponded, corresponded to a function that was basically, you know, giving me a way to map places to, uh, sorry, uh, tokens to tokens. And now each one of these arcs is promoted to a new transition up here. So you see that a gradient deconstruction actually is building a sort of foliation of your base net. And indeed, you can, you can really see this from this picture, but it will become clearer later, but you can map this top net back to the base net by saying, okay, this ballooned up places now can be mapped back to the place I started from and save for transitions. Um, cool. Uh, so, um, one thing that we proved is that this internalization process has uh, cool properties among which being functorial. So you see that a, a, a morphism in a Petri set star, for instance, is just an F such that F composed with M sharp uh, is equal to M sharp. And the idea is that if you now do the gritting deconstruction on M sharp and M sharp, then uh, you have this canonical projection functors to the category you started from. And this is this idea that here on the right, you can compile this uh, ballooned up net. You can map it back to the net you started from. And you see that in this situation, you can basically lift this F functor uh, to a functor between the corresponding um, great and dick constructions. Uh, so if I have a functor between base nets, I will also have a functor between their balloon.nets. And this obviously works because this F respects the semantics. This is the bottom triangles commuting. Uh, this holds both for uh, the span case and uh, the set star case. Now we can consider Petri 1, which is the category of patterns with trivial semantics. So basically, you are sending uh, each place of your net, to, I mean, you're sending the free symmetric strict monodal category corresponding to your net to the category with just one element, so which is very sad, it's basically, you know, that you say, okay, the only properties that token can have is being a token, and so every time you can, you have a transition that corresponds to a very sad function that just does the obvious, unique, possible things. Um, but now the idea is that I have two ways to send a net in Petri set star to Petri 1. Uh, the first one is by using this great deconstruction, so, you know, embedding the semantics in the net. And the second one is by, you know, just like uh, not giving a heck and, you know, just saying, okay, I'll forget about the semantics altogether. And, uh, and that's it, I'll just take the pattern net. And obviously this pi 
uh, factors I was uh, showing you before induce some uh, natural transformations between uh, these two possible embeddings. Um, which means that every time, this is again just another way to say that every time you can perform the gridding construction, you can map it back to the net you started with, and this procedure is itself factorial. This is what pi being a natural transformation tells you. Uh, so that's basically it. Uh, and uh, directions of future work is that uh, this thing, for instance, doesn't work in the relational case. And the reason why it doesn't work in the relational case is because imagine this, if you have that X is related to Y and Y prime, and Y and Y prime uh, are both related to some Z, then when you compose the relation, these two relations, you just get that X is related to Z. And so you see, you have basically two ways of going from X to Z. One was going to Y prime, the other one was going to Y. But when you compose relations, these two things are identified. And this basically means that when your semantics is in rel, you are introducing further equations that make the gradient deconstruction on rel, or for functors to rel, not free. And so you can't prove that you have a free monoidal categories because these different paths are identified. This is exactly why we take the span case instead, because the span case distinguishes between paths. So when you compose spans, these two ways of going from uh, X to Z will be preserved, and you will still be able to distinguish them, and so you have no new equations arising in your model, and everything is good, and everyone is happy, especially us, because our, our stuff works. Uh, okay, so uh, an obvious direction of future work is to generalize these results, uh, basically trying to characterize which semantics um, are, um, you know, make our gradient trick to work. Uh, and yeah, that, that's basically what uh, are we going to do, probably, in the future. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Very well. <clears throat> Thanks, Fabrizio, for the for the uh, for your presentation for your overview. I well, in fact, I mean, rel is a very peculiar case, right? Uh, spans uh, boils down to have some kind of multi-relation uh, presentation, right? Where you can yeah. basically add some um, how can I say some information about the specific uh, link so that you can distinguish much more than just in uh, relation and uh, in fact you, one of the possibility would be to have uh, i mean to focus precisely on which kind of algebraic residation you can find for span categories in the end right like hypergraph categories or the like yes and, and yes. maybe for those uh, the trick should be working which so, is yeah, I mean, I, all I, the more categories to the end i think in general the trick will work for all the categories that are uh, granular enough to keep track of what's going on, basically, and they are not forgetting information when you compose. But another thing that is also um, worth investigating is that, you know, all these categories we're use, using here are set-like, which means that your objects are basically sets. And that's because we apply the category of elements, this dumbed-down dumb version of the Vietnamese construction. But it would also be cool to see what happens if I just do the real written deconstruction, which is for functors in cat, the category of categories. And you know, at that point, you can characterize, you can do that because every, every category has objects. So you can basically do a very similar kind of trick. But at that point, uh, you, you, know, you can characterize which one of these functors actually give you a free category. But my feeling is that to do that, uh, we need a lot of, you know, high level tools in category theory that I'm not 100% sure I, I want to learn uh, in, like, in the short term, but uh, I'll, we'll see, we'll see where this brings us, so. Thanks, well, indeed, the fact is that uh, you still have to keep uh, easy the intuition about your construction. I mean, category of elements are, I mean, it, they are a uh, toned down growth and deconstruction, but yeah. at least they, are, they have a 
immediate and clear intuition of what's going yes, on. Um, and over, while the overall people, unfortunately, people doing algebraic geometry are never happy with just taking the simple thing, and so they, they tend to build <laughs> very complicated stuff. But then it turns out to be useful. So great. Okay, I see. Uh, very well. I think that we are uh, more or less uh, done. Thanks again, uh, Fabrizio. If there are no additional questions, I will move directly to the um, next session, and I leave uh, the um, chair to Raiko. And um, let's see. Thanks again, uh, Fabrizio. Thank you. Now let's see. Let's put uh, in the loop uh, oh, yeah, Raiko. Hi, Raiko. Hello. Happy to be <laughs> see you there. And uh, the next one should be Roberto. Oh, Roberto. Did I get Did I get the order right? Uh, no. Yes. 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 Everything. No. Is it's perfect. Correct. It's correct. You were. You are trying to confuse me, Raiko. Huh? So, okay, I will disappear and I'll be the director on the backstage. And so I leave it to you. And uh, that's it. When you're ready, uh, Roberto, please share the screen and I'll uh, put your slides online. Okay. Okay, so this is the session on logics and algebras, uh, which I have the pleasure to share. And we have two talks in the session. The first one is by Roberto Bruni, Ugo Montanari, and Matteo Samarito um, on algebras for 3D composable graphs. So please, Roberto, go ahead. Thank Hi. you, Raiko. Been already. So uh, I will start with uh, a short uh, introduction, uh, and then uh, with some background, and then uh, I will uh, present uh, our contribution. So uh, the context where uh, our work takes place is that of uh, optimization problems. Uh, here, for simplicity, let us consider the case where we have uh, uh, some sets of variables, uh, x and y. Uh, that can take uh, values of an, a domain uh, D. And then we have uh, a cost function that we want to minimize for uh, certain uh, uh, parameters uh, X, uh, while other parameters are uh, free, are part of the context. And uh, the interesting part is that uh, this cost function uh, is uh, expressed uh, as the sum uh, of uh, several functions uh, each one uh, considering uh, a subset uh, of the variables uh, in X uh, and Y. Mm -hmm. And these functions are atomic. They cannot be further uh, decomposed. Uh, so we would like to minimize the sum of these cost functions with respect to the variable in the set uh, X. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, what happens is that uh, each of these uh, uh, functions, F1, Fm, is uh, uh, essentially a multidimensional table hmm? where uh, if uh, uh, zi has ki variables, uh, each taking n possible values, uh, it means uh, that uh, each of this table has n to the ki uh, entries. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, representation of f as the sum of f1, fm, is interesting because uh, they allow for uh, a more compact uh, representation of the cost function that having just one large table for the wall uh, F. And this is illustrated on a very simple uh, example that I will use uh, as a sort of running uh, example with small variations. Here we have uh, F with three uh, variables, X1, X2, and Y that can be expressed as the sum of two functions taking only two values. Uh, one In one case, x, y, x1 and y, and in the other case, y and x2. Then uh, uh, the table on the left uh, would have uh, n to the cube uh, entries, while uh, uh, the problem uh, as represented on the right uh, is uh, represented just as two tables, each uh, one uh, with uh, n square uh, n square uh, entries. Uh, so we have a more compact uh, 
representation of the problem with respect to the space uh, uh, needed. Then uh, uh, these kind of problems can be solved uh, using dynamic programming techniques, uh, where the idea is to uh, compute uh, uh, the minimization step by step. Uh, so we have an evaluation procedure that uh, consider uh, a sort of structural recursion over the problem. At each step, uh, it takes one of the variable in the set uh, X, consider all the functions uh, related to uh, small X, and uh, uh, try to optimize uh, uh, the cost for, the, for them. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, if we uh, go back to the previous example, uh, or we want to minimize with respect to x1 and x2. So what we can do is to consider x1 first. Only the table A involves uh, x1. So we can minimize the table by choosing the values for x1. Then uh, uh, we can consider x2. This time only the table B uh, consider x2. So we minimize uh, B separately, and in the end, uh, we get uh, uh, a function that is obtained as the sum of the two uh, functions we have minimized. Uh, now, um, it happens that the outcome of the evaluation procedure does not depend on the order of variable elimination. So here we could have eliminated X2 first and then uh, X1, and the uh, final cost would not have changed. But uh, uh, depending on the cases, the computational cost uh, of the evaluation procedure may instead uh, change. So the so-called secondary optimization problems relies on finding the best order for variable elimination with respect to the computational cost uh, point of view. And uh, the problem that we are addressing is whether or not uh, a graphical approach uh, can help us to find uh, or to characterize uh, optimal uh, uh, strategies for variable elimination. Uh, how can we represent uh, such a problem using uh, uh, graphs? Well, uh, uh, one, the representation we are considering is where uh, uh, each variable corresponds to a node of the graph. And each uh, uh, atomic table, atomic function, uh, correspond to an hierarchy attached to the variables uh, it considers. So again, let us take our uh, uh, simple uh, example. This uh, uh, can be represented uh, as the following uh, uh, hypergraph, where we have two uh, edges, uh, A and B. A is attached to the node X1, X1 Y, and B is attached to the, node, uh, to the nodes Y and X2. Uh, then uh, um, we may consider uh, uh, concrete uh, graphs, or uh, uh, for the sake of the problem, we may decide to abstract on certain uh, uh, part or certain aspects of the, of the graph. Mm -hmm. So when we are speaking about concrete networks, uh, uh, it means that we are fixing the name of the nodes of the elements of the graph. Uh, and uh, also we want to distinguish uh, a separate set of nodes, uh, in this case Y in blue, for the interface. These are the sort of uh, uh, parameters of the problems, open parameters of the, of the problem. Mm -hmm. While X1 and X2 that are the variables with respect to which we want to minimize the cost function are just uh, local uh, names. In abstract networks, the idea is that local names uh, are not uh, important. So we can rename them uh, as we like, uh, as far uh, as we keep uh, uh, track of the names in the interface. Mm -hmm. So abstract networks uh, essentially is are uh, graphs uh, up to isomorphism. Eh? And uh, uh, to each uh, instance of the problem, uh, there is exactly one abstract network that uh, uh, can uh, correspond to it. Mm -hmm. So um, the problem statement is as follow. Uh, given this graphical representation of uh, the optimization problem, 
uh, we would like to find uh, an algebraic uh, structure that can drive us uh, to uh, an evaluation procedure uh, defined by structural recursion, by exploiting the structure of the terms. Mm -hmm. The algebraic side is interesting because it allows to parse uh, the graph uh, with a fixed uh, strategy and also to define homomorphic properties of the graph just by structural recursion. Uh, the graphical side is also interesting because uh, uh, it allows to grasp uh, the conceptual models underlying the problem with uh, an abstract structure that uh, consists of the graph taken up to uh, isomorphism. Um, there are some constraints on this uh, algebraic structure that we look uh, for. Uh, one of them is that we would like to take into account also the computational cost related to the particular algebraic representation that we are considering for the problem. Uh, so we would like that uh, uh, the axiom that we impose on the terms uh, takes into account uh, the computational cost uh, and respect uh, them. And uh, also, we would like to draw some precise correspondence between uh, the algebraic, uh, the term-like representation and the graphical uh, model. Uh, our contribution is uh, as follow. We define uh, uh, a particular uh, uh, algebra of graph called uh, loose network uh, algebra. And we show that it is fair with respect to the evaluation complexity in the sense that uh, two uh, terms that are equivalent uh, will correspond to an evaluation procedure uh, with the same uh, uh, complexity. Uh, also, we will uh, um, identify a subclass of terms called canonical that defines a locally optimal uh, strategy so that uh, the optimal strategy will necessarily be one of these uh, canonical term, uh, optimal with respect to the complexity of the evaluation procedure, of course. And then uh, to draw the correspondence between the term-like representation and the graphical side of the problem, we will draw uh, correspondence with uh, uh, Milner's uh, binding by graphs uh, and also with uh, a particular class of three uh, decomposition representation of the graph called uh, uh, elementary. Mm -hmm. I will introduce uh, all of these concepts one by one. First, uh, some uh, background. Uh, our work builds on a previous work uh, by uh, Matteo, Hugo, and Alain Chocam. Uh, where uh, uh, they introduced the uh, network algebra inspired by process calculi that allow us to give uh, a term-like representation of the, of the problem. Here, the terms that we are considering are uh, nil for the empty problem or the empty graph. Mm -hmm. Uh, an atomic constraint uh, uh, A attached to some variables that represents an atomic problem. The parallel composition of problems to represent uh, composite uh, problems. Uh, the restriction inspired by process calculate, the operator restriction or uh, uh, hiding, which is represented by putting a name within uh, brackets in front of a problem to uh, represent uh, the order in which the, the variables uh, uh, are uh, eliminated, uh, in which they are resolved. And then uh, um, a, a structure of a permutation algebra, where we allow to uh, rename uh, the, um, the variables uh, attached to the problem, which is helpful uh, to deal with uh, uh, bindings, uh, alpha conversion, and uh, all this uh, stuff in the initial uh, model. Okay, so this is the grammar that we are considering uh, with the elements that I've just uh, described. And uh, being an algebra, it means that we put some axiom on, uh, on them, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the axiom that we are considering uh, are not uh, uh, particularly new. 
the first set of axioms express uh, that the parallel composition is uh, uh, just a commutative monoid. So the order in which we list uh, the atomic problems uh, is not uh, important. Um, then we have uh, axioms for dealing with restrictions, saying that uh, the order of restriction is also uh, not uh, important. Uh, we allow alpha conversion of uh, uh, restricted uh, names. And uh, um, one important axiom is that of scope extension. The idea is that uh, if uh, the variable x uh, does not appear in the problem, in the subproblem Q, then uh, restricting it uh, over uh, the composite problem P and Q is the same as restricting it over, uh, over P, mm -hmm. because Q is not affected by the value of X. And then we have the axiom of permutation algebras uh, uh, together with the distributivity of permutation over the other uh, um, uh, algebraic structure. Uh, this uh, algebra is called uh, uh, strong, mm? and uh, uh, it will be distinguished from the loose algebra that we will introduce next, where uh, we will uh, relax uh, some of the axioms. Uh, the graphical counterpart of this algebraic structure is exactly that of abstract networks. Uh, where the correspondence uh, can be drawn uh, immediately. Each atomic problem corresponds to an edge attached to the nodes named as the parameter of the of A. A restriction of uh, X in P corresponds to move the name X from the interface of P to uh, a local uh, name. Uh, the um, parallel composition corresponds to place P and Q side by side, uh, identifying the common names in the interface, uh, but not uh, uh, local names. Local names are kept uh, distinguished. Uh, permutation just uh, applies uh, to uh, all the nodes to rename them, and nil uh, is just uh, the empty graph. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the previous result uh, by Matteo, Hugo, and Alain was to show that uh, equivalent terms uh, define the same uh, abstract network. So that abstract networks are an initial model for the strong uh, algebra. And the same applies to the cost uh, function. They are also uh, defining a strong algebra. I will not spend much time on the formal definition of it. A cost function takes evaluation of variables and gives us a cost. And uh, uh, we can exploit uh, the structure of term uh, to um, uh, um, compute the cost of a problem by structural uh, uh, recursion. Once we have assigned a corresponding uh, uh, function to each uh, atomic uh, uh, edge of the graph, uh, and the uh, restriction corresponds to uh, solve the problem with respect to the uh, variable x, uh, to minimize the cost function with respect to x. Mm. Um, so uh, this is interesting because it means that if two terms uh, are equated by the strong axioms, then they define uh, the same cost function. So uh, the algebraic structure is fair with respect to the cost function. On the other hand, uh, this is not true for uh, um, computational complexity. We may have uh, uh, terms that are equivalent with respect to the axioms, so they represent the same problem, but they correspond uh, to different evaluation procedures uh, that uh, will uh, have uh, a different computational complexity. Um, and uh, to simplify a little bit uh, the measure of complexity, uh, we uh, decide to consider just uh, the largest dimension of the tables involved in the solution of the uh, problem, uh, so that uh, the complexity measure can be defined again 
uh, easily by uh, exploiting the algebraic uh, structure of the terms. Uh, so if we have an atomic problem, uh, uh, its complexity is given by the number of variables that are uh, involved in the problems, the dimension of the table that corresponds to the edge. Uh, when we eliminate one variable, we need to solve the problem P, uh, which uh, uh, will have uh, um, a certain complexity. So uh, this will not uh, change the complexity. If we need to solve the composite uh, problem, we need to take uh, uh, the maximal values between, between among the complexity of P, the complexity of Q, and the complexity of the composite uh, problem P in, in parallel with Q. Uh, permutation will not affect uh, complexity, and uh, the empty problem has a trivial complexity. Uh, one uh, uh, point to keep in mind, I uh, will uh, come back to this uh, also later on, uh, is that uh, the scope extension axiom uh, does not respect uh, this uh, uh, complexity evaluation, this complexity measure. Because uh, in general, if we move the restriction at the end uh, of the problem, uh, the complexity will be uh, larger than uh, if we eliminate x uh, as soon as possible. And that's uh, the intuition. So this means that complexity evaluation is not a strong algebra, contrary to the uh, cost function we have seen before, because uh, it does not respect uh, the scope extension axiom. Uh, just to give you an example, let us consider Again, uh, um, the composite problem with A and B, they share uh, a variable Y, and uh, we decide to eliminate the variables in this order, first Y, then Z, and then X. In order to eliminate Y, we need to solve the three-dimensional problems involving both A and B. Then uh, only the variable X and Z remain, so we have a two-dimensional problem that corresponds to the solution of Z. And then finally, we have uh, one uh, dimensional problem for eliminating x. So the worst case that we need to consider is uh, uh, the three-dimensional uh, problem that we solved at the beginning. Uh, if we um, find a different way to uh, um, eliminate uh, the variable, the different evaluation procedure, Note that P and Q are equivalent in the strong algebra because we can apply the scope extension axiom. Then we get that we can eliminate Z uh, as soon as possible, X as soon as possible. This corresponds to solve uh, uh, two dimensional problems. And then we are left with a one dimensional one. So uh, the complexity of Q will be two instead of three. Mm -hmm. So equivalent terms will exhibit different complexity measures. So our contribution is to study an algebraic structure that uh, is fair with respect to the complexity measure and that uh, uh, has also a graphical uh, counterpart that cannot be uh, that of um, um, abstract networks uh, because uh, it will be uh, a little uh, bit uh, more uh, concrete than that. So the loose network specification is the same as the strong one, except that we eliminate a bunch of axioms, the scope extension axioms and uh, uh, the reordering of uh, variables. And for the rest, we keep uh, all the algebraic structure we had before. Then we look for a graphical counterpart of this specification, if uh, it exists, and uh, uh, the first connection we present is that with uh, Milner's bigraph. I will not uh, uh, spend much time on introducing bigraphs, uh, as this has already been done by Blair and Marco uh, at the beginning of the um, program. Uh, so the idea here is that the nesting of resolutions uh, induces a hierarchical structure that will correspond uh, to the plaque structure of the uh, by graph. So the order of nesting form a tree that will correspond to the place graph of the by graph. Then 
uh, uh, we need to decide where to put uh, um, uh, the edges, uh, and they will belong uh, to the place according to the term uh, structure. The interesting part is that uh, a variable that is introduced by a restriction is only visible within its scope. Uh, and uh, for this reason, uh, we cannot consider the general model of by graph, but we restrict to consider binding by graph that uh, enforce this uh, property. And binding by graph will form uh, an algebra of uh, the loose, uh, loose algebra. Mm -hmm where uh, uh, the atomic uh, uh, problem, the atomic uh, um, edges A will correspond to uh, 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 the bigraph with only one edge A and three names uh, X1, Xn. The restriction operator uh, will introduce a new control that introduces the variable X that will be used, uh, will possibly be used by the bigraph embedded in it. The parallel composition corresponds to put the two bigraph uh, side by side by sharing their free names. Permutation just renames uh, the node of the bigraph, and uh, nil is the empty uh, bigraph. So, um, uh, uh, lean equivalent binding bigraphs uh, will be the analogous of abstract networks for the loose uh, algebra. Here is a, an example. If we have the composite problem uh, uh, A, X, Y, B, Y, Z restricted with Y, it means that uh, uh, as a bigraph, we will introduce a restriction on Y, and inside it, we will place the two arcs uh, uh, A and B, the two controls A and B. Uh, vice versa, if we are considering uh, a term where first we restrict A with respect to X and then B with respect to Z and all of them with respect to Y, uh, we will have uh, uh, a topmost control that introduces the variable Y to be used by A and B that will be embedded in the uh, restriction over X and in the restriction over Z. Uh, then uh, uh, we uh, will define uh, some particular classes of terms in the loose uh, algebra that are called normal and canonical. And we will see that canonical terms will play a fundamental role uh, to, um, with respect to the complexity measure because they will correspond to optim locally optimal solution with respect to complexity. So normal terms uh, are very simple. They uh, have all the variable elimination uh, at the end uh, of the term, on top of the uh, structure of the term. Then, uh, um, so they consist of a series uh, of uh, variable elimination and uh, uh, then a parallel composition of uh, arcs. While canonical terms uh, are such that uh, the direct form of scope extension that moves the restriction of X uh, inside the parallel composition is not uh, applicable. Uh, so they are characterized by this uh, dynamic uh, property. And the main result is here is that the complexity measure forms uh, a loose network uh, uh, algebra. So, this algebra is fair with respect to the evaluation of complexity. This is because we have uh, uh, relaxed uh, the scope extension uh, uh, axiom. And uh, uh, since uh, pushing a variable inside can only diminish the um, complexity, it means uh, that uh, the optimal complexity evaluation strategy must correspond to a canonical term where it is not possible to uh, apply this uh, uh, step. Let us see some examples of normal and uh, canonical uh, terms. Here we have uh, uh, the three restriction on top. So this term is uh, normal and it is also canonical because Y cannot uh, uh, be put uh, inside the parallel composition. If we change the order of uh, variable uh, elimination, we have that uh, this term is still in normal uh, form, 
but it's not canonical because X can be pushed inside the parallel composition and applied just to A. Uh, uh, if we do that, then we have a term that is no more in normal form and uh, is not uh, even canonical because again, we could push Z inside the parallel composition. So this is not an optimal, a locally optimal solution. Uh, if we push Z inside, uh, instead we get a term that is not normal, but uh, it's uh, uh, canonical. So the first and second and last terms are a suitable candidate for the optimal uh, strategy. Note that all these terms will be strong equivalent, eh? but they are different with respect to the loose uh, algebra. Uh, our first uh, contribution regarding canonical terms uh, is to give uh, a type system that characterizes them. I'm a bit uh, running out of time, so I will not spend uh, much time on the type system. I will just mention that uh, a term is canonical if and only if uh, it can be typed, where the type, as, the type uh, judgment assigns the set of variables that can be restricted on top of P. To each term p. I will skip the example of typeability. And uh, I will come to the uh, second uh, uh, graphical correspondence between the algebraic structure and the graphical structure uh, that draw uh, an analogy between uh, canonical terms in loose algebras and uh, uh, a particular class of three decompositions called uh, elementary. What is a tree decomposition? Is uh, a tree that describes how to parse uh, uh, a graph. Uh, the idea is that each node of T represents uh, a part of the graph that we are uh, dealing with. Uh, in particular, each node of T is associated with a set of nodes of G. Eh? And the arcs attached to this node will also belong to that uh, uh, node of the tree. Yeah, well, Bartol, the... sorry, I, I think we have to conclude relatively yes, soon. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Thanks. So uh, I will skip uh, the formal uh, uh, definition. I hope to give you the uh, idea. Uh, mm, elementary tree decomposition uh, are particular tree where uh, each node introduces just uh, one local variable and not uh, many of them. Here are uh, some examples that uh, uh, I will skip. Uh, the correspondence we draw is uh, a transformation for elementary tree decomposition to uh, loose terms. So we have one side of the direction, which in general is not uh, injective in the sense that we can have different uh, tree decomposition that are mapped to the same uh, term. Then we have an opposite uh, uh, transformation from loose terms to elementary tree decomposition that exploit uh, the uh, algebraic structure of the term to be defined uh, uh, in a modular way and uh, also in general uh, is not uh, uh, injective so we may have uh, uh, different uh, loose terms that are mapped to the same uh, elementary tree decomposition however if we restrict to um, canonical terms, uh, this mapping is injective. So, uh, to conclude, uh, we have investigated uh, uh, a new uh, um, graphical algebra of loose terms, uh, I've drawn a correspondence with binding uh, by graphs, uh, I've given a notion of canonical uh, terms that corresponds uh, to uh, elementary three uh, decompositions for the graph, and also allows to derive uh, uh, optimal local uh, uh, evaluation uh, uh, strategies. Uh, a conjecture that uh, is remained open is whether or not, uh, if we start from a canonical term, we draw the corresponding elementary tree decomposition and go back, we uh, reach again uh, the canonical terms from which we started. And uh, as future works, uh, we would like to exploit uh, the term-like representation to uh, derive heuristics for um, finding out optimal complexity strategy for the evaluation of the problem, and to study the relation with uh, hyperedge replacement grammars that also give a sort of hierarchy in the parsing of the graph. I think uh, I've been 
uh, running out of all the time. Thank you for uh, your patience. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, very nice. Um, I uh, I have a question, uh, maybe and a reference for you. So, um, in in sort of graph matching, people have been working for quite some time with something called read to, read to, read to networks, R E T E, uh, mm -hmm. which basically means that you have. Um, I mean, if you want to match the left hand side of a rule, okay, um, mm -hmm. or any graph, in fact, you 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 make a three decomposition of that left hand side down to individual nodes and edges, and then you start matching the individual nodes and edges and then basically compose matches wherever they are compatible uh, uh, as you go up the tree, mm -hmm. okay? So in the end, so, so, so the mechanism here is not really to find a single match, but to find all possible matches. Yep. And, and then this is quite efficient and there is a relation with sort of incremental matching if you if you transform the graph, but that is sort of a slightly different yeah, part uh, of the problem. So, There's been quite so, some work on this. Um, I so, see. So maybe it, there is it an looks like this could the, be another example. Sorry. Uh, I see. Maybe there is a correspondence uh, with uh, the loose algebra, in this sense, because the mm -hmm. the algebra that we are considering also give you. So the, I can send you a reference on this. Yep. Yeah. If you send me, uh, if you send the reference so to me, I will look at, uh, at it. Yeah. And I think the next speaker is actually, I mean, uh, I, I seem to recall there was a paper, I think at ICGT or one of the workshops last year, where the, the from from the group of, of uh, where Sven and, and, and uh, the others uh, for the next paper are from, which also did some work in that in that uh, direction. So that I think was the last one, the most recent one that I saw. So that may also be a, an interesting connection. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it seems like you basically do an algebraic sort of version of of, of the kind yeah. of tree decomposition for matching a graph decomp uh, for, for, for matching graphs that 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 that, that they're doing. Okay. All right. Uh, I think we have to stop here. But thank you very much. And uh, yeah. sorry for taking so much time. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's fast enough. <laughs> that that found. Right. And then I think we need to get uh, Swen in on this. Uh, Fabio, can you let him in or how do we do that? Should I leave the studio? Uh, yes, you may as well, unless ah, yes, when is coming. No, he's not. <laughs> okay, I think Sven is coming. Um, Right, so the next talk is presented by Sven Schneider and his work together with Lukas Saki Loglu, uh, Maria Maximova, and Holger Giese, all in uh, Potsdam, I believe, um, on optimistic and pessimistic on the fly analysis for metric temporal graph logic. And uh, if you want to comment on the question of the previous talk, feel free, but you don't have to. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, I want to consider the error system, and we want to also consider a specification and as a main goal on the specification that is able to then the action algorithm attacks those discrete events of the system that are produced by the that specification. As a result of some second algorithm, so it can be in different rates of can Your audio is very your your audio is very bad. Uh, okay. So maybe can you switch your video off? Yeah, I can. Uh, so save a bit of bandwidth in that way, and maybe your audio will improve. Thank you. Okay, so not really, but so we are getting interrupted in different ways. So we have we can drop the warnings, errors, or successes, and they can be used for the of the 
Sorry, Sven, your, I'm sorry, Sven, your audio is still uh, uh, too, too, too bad. It's, it's, not, it's, it's difficult to understand anything. I don't know what we can do. Yeah, maybe try to reconnect or something. Hi, Sven, now I can see you twice. Yeah. Twice? Hmm. Well, you're still in the other session, maybe. I, I, but now I can hear you, hear me you very well. So, so, so the other session. Yep. It may just, now I can hear you, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, there, that's good. I think you probably um, have to you start. Do you see also the screen? I think. Well, no, well. not yet. I see your, your, your icon here. Now I can. I think you have to go back to the to the to the pre-slide and, and start presenting that again i think i mean not yeah so with the first slide yeah, yeah please okay from the from the beginning basically yeah okay well yeah yeah I mean, we, we we've got the title i guess but the next the next mm -hmm. one well. okay <laughs> thank you. so you tell me when i should start right yeah, yeah please go ahead okay um, so I will just represent uh, the, the beginning. So what we do is we consider a running system and uh, we consider also a specification and our basic goal is to check this running system against that specification. So what we actually want to come up with is a online satisfaction checking algorithm that checks discrete events that uh, are produced by this running system against that specification. And as an output of this online satisfaction checking algorithm, we want to obtain a set of violations also at runtime for each of these events. We want to check uh, this event then against the specification and return a set of violations in each step. So uh, these violations can be interpreted in different, uh, in different ways. For example, they can be uh, representing warnings or errors or successes of subtasks. And they can be used to adapt this running system, or they can be used to notify users of this running system when something goes wrong, for example. Also, lastly, this running system, we can interpret this here uh, that it's being tested against that specification, and these violations can be helpful that, for that purpose. So actually, what we do return is um, we return two kinds of violations, pessimistic violations and optimistic violations. Uh, and I will talk about why we return these two violations later on. These online satisfaction checking algorithms can have, uh, for example, these three properties here. It can be sound by returning the correct sets of violations. It could be implementable. That means that it can be implemented in a piece of software. Also, um, this, uh, this piece of software could then be efficient with respect to runtime and memory consumption. Um, also, lastly, the specification here that we use as an input, that can be more or less expressive. But of course, we want to be, uh, that be more expressive. So first, I want to talk about uh, what, which formalism we are using for this running system and what these discrete events are that are exhibited or exerted by that running system. So basically, what we assume is that we have a timed graph sequence that is submitted to this online checking satisfaction algorithm. So what is such a timed graph sequence? It's a sequence of time spans. So we have here 
uh, a time graph sequence. Um, and we have here three uh, time spans. And each has a duration uh, of, a, of a real value to duration, delta 0, delta 1, delta 2. And for simplicity, we omit those um, graphs in between. Basically, such a time span just represents how one graph has changed to another in a certain period of time. That is, we make no basic assumption on how the system actually generates these time graph sequences. That is, we don't really require that it is generated by a time graph transformation system, for example, but it could also be uh, in, a, in an online uh, setting where uh, it's generated by some kind of system just generating uh, some, something that can be interpreted as a graph over time. So we make no assumption on that. For example, when a user would be in this system as a participant, we wouldn't know exactly by which rules he would interact with that system. So we consider running example in this talk. Um, this is the type graph of this running example. Uh, while this uh, type graph does not contain attributes, they are very well supported in our approach. So this um, example is about a task that may be completed afterwards, or it may go defunctional after some time. So that's this basic idea. And so uh, I will talk about that in, in the rest of the talk as well. So going back to this overview picture, um, now I want to talk about which kinds of specifications do we consider for this, um, this approach here. So basically, this here is one first property, P, which states that each spawned task in the system should be functional until it is completed within five minutes. So this is one of those properties that we want to capture with this specification formalism. So here is one timed graph sequence. In this timed graph sequence, we have one task T1 that is uh, created here in G1 one task t2 which is created in g2 t1 is completed in g3 and uh, c2 is completed in g4 so um, we can observe that t1 and t2 have different deadlines so with these five minutes t1 must be completed within five minutes which is the case because these two steps are summed up to five time units or five minutes while t2 is not complete in time it takes six minutes for t2 to complete here so this uh, TC pattern here, for example, here and here, represents that the task T is completed. In addition, we also consider more. We consider here a task T3, which goes defunctional in G2 and which never recovers from that state afterwards. Also, lastly, we have here a task T4, which is created in G3. And while this time graph transformation sequence here is, has ended, it has had no time to uh, complete, and it also did not go defunctional. Finally, we uh, add also a uh, T1 node here in this last graph, indicating that this uh, time graph transformation sequence has terminated. In an actual setting, this may be the reason that this running system then eventually has been shut down, and that we know that no further steps will occur. So depending on what we want to analyze, we may or may not add this uh, T1 or terminated node in this last graph. The, the basic problem for the specification formalism is now that we must be able to identify when tasks are freshly added to this uh, to the graph. So this is here for T1, T3, T2, and T4. These are, are these four places where a new task is spawned. We need to be able to identify that with that logic. And also what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to track those tasks over time in this time graph sequence. So we need to be able to track T1 here over these two steps, and we need to be able to track T2 over these two steps. And it's important that we um, have this matching to be able to uh, distinguish between these individual deadlines for those different tasks. So um, what we use as a specification formalism now in this talk is the metric temporal graph logic. Basically, there are uh, two kinds of properties. We have state properties. These are basically nest graph conditions, as, as uh, we, we probably all know them. In addition, we have path properties. We have this exists new operator here. This exists new operator is similar to this exists operator from before. But here, this is a path property. And this new, um, this end, this new means that we must be able now to extend this match to some some at least one uh, new graph element that has been just freshly added to this time graph sequence, as it is important here for tasks. Also, it's equipped with an interval uh, where we can specify in which future time range this should be matched. Uh, similar to LTL, CTL, and other uh, temporal logics, we have an until operator. So here, this until operator states that phi1 should hold until eventually phi2 holds, and uh, until phi2 holds, uh, phi1 has to hold the entire time. 
and um, phi2 has to be satisfied at some point specified with, with also this interval i here. Um, of course, it's quite easy to add further derived operators as for nest graph conditions. For example, this for all new operator, we will use that subsequently. It's a dual operator to the exists new operator and from until we can, of course, also derive eventually and globally and other operators as well. So uh, coming back uh, to this uh, example from before, now I want to discuss how we, or show how we um, formalize this, um, this property up here. So in MTGL, we would write this down like this. So basically what we have is, the, we can read this as for all fresh matches of T, this is this first part here. Um, so we use this uh, for all new operator here, which is the dual to the exists new operator. And we consider all future time points basically from the beginning. So for all fresh matches of T, this is now this left-hand side. The match of T cannot be extended to a match of TB. That would express that it goes defunctional until in zero to five time units. This is this part in the middle. And this right part here states that the match of T can be extended to a match of TC. So it, it can be completed in, in these five minutes. Basically for, for this uh, time graph sequence down here, we now want to uh, then check whether this time graph sequence satisfies this uh, uh, metric temporal graph condition here by uh, in, in our online satisfaction checking algorithm. So going back to this overview picture, the next step, or what, what we see is now that we, we use MTGL conditions as a specification. And um, we believe that MTGL is highly useful for this um, setting of time graph sequences because we can inspect and inspect graphs and track elements over time as required by this property P in this run example that I discussed. Um, of course, uh, more operators may be useful in the future, but I will talk about that later. So um, as a next step, I want to talk about these outputs. So before going into the details on how this algorithm works, I want to go into the, to the outputs. Well, the question is, of course, why do we re return two kinds of violations and what are they? So actually, we have uh, three uh, kinds of different um, uh, violations. We have true violations, pessimistic violations, and optimistic violations. And ideally, we would generate those true violations, but that is not always possible. Not always possible. So what we have is, in this setting now, our metric temporal graph condition up here and the same time graph sequence down here. And what we can do is we can think about what this online satisfaction checking algorithm should return in each point in time in this time graph sequence. And we have three different modes, basically, three different sets of violations that would be returned. So I will discuss those crossing points here. In an ideal world, we would be able to return the true violations. The true violations are those that really indicate where something goes wrong. So in the beginning, we don't have any violation. But here in, the, in G1, we have a violation T3. So T3 would be a violation of the specification because afterwards it goes defunctional. So T3 will not be completed in time without being defunctional before. Also in the next step, we have T2 as a true violation because afterwards it will be not completed in time this time. And here T4 would be a true violation because afterwards it will not be complete in time as well. So uh, we see that this uh, middle line here with the true violations um, checks also what's going to happen in the future. So thereby it requires global knowledge about the entire time graph sequence. And that is certainly not possible in an online setting where we get those time spans one by one. So that's, that's why we can't really return those true violations in an online setting. But what we can do is we can return uh, pessimistic violations. Pessimistic violations are pessimistic in the sense that they will throw a violation um, if it's possible that something will go wrong in the future. So the difference between true and pessimistic violations is here that T1 is added and also that T1 is added also here. So why is T1 now additionally added here? T1 is additionally added um, because at G1, we don't know whether uh, T1 will be completed in time. It turns out later on that it will be completed in time, but just having the knowledge about the time graph sequence of G0 and G1, we don't know that. So being pessimistic, we throw another violation here. That is, of course, one possible way to see that. Um, but there is also an optimistic perspective. So in an optimistic perspective, we see that down here. The difference is here in T3, T2, and T4. So T3 is not a violation right now because um, even though we see with a, with a global knowledge that afterwards it will go defunctional, right now we don't know that. So we, being optimistic, we believe that, okay, it's possible that it will be um, 
that it will com be completed in time, and that's why we don't throw a violation. Similarly for T2, we don't know yet that it will not be completed in time later on, so we are optimistic not returning violation here. And the same case for T4, where we don't know that uh, the, uh, that the time cross sequence will stop before T4 has a chance to complete. So basically, if you compare these three rows, what you see is that the pessimistic and optimistic um, violation sets are over and under approximations of those true violations. And that is uh, an important thing. So uh, we can see that it makes possibly sense to, to uh, obtain both of them and to compare them. In particular, in this example, we see that um, knowing that uh, T3 and T3 is a violation here is a valid or possible or valuable information to the user because he then realizes that there's a problem with T3 and also from the difference between this set up here and this set down here, the, the user sees that T1 and T2 are still active and are still waiting to be completed. So both of these kinds of information can be helpful to the user in this um, case study and this example. Coming back to this uh, overview picture, now that we discussed uh, pessimistic violations and optimistic violations, I would like to point out that we um, can, we can now uh, check whether uh, how this online satisfaction checking algorithm works. So let's go shortly into the details of that. Um, so what we have is a stream of time spans, and we have an, a metric temporal graph logic condition. So we need to think about how can we evaluate that. So first of all, we have uh, nested graph conditions. So state properties in this metric temporal graph condition, they can be evaluated quite easily for this ongoing stream of information there, ongoing stream of graphs. So this just local evaluation just for finesse graph condition, that's not really a problem. The, the next step is that we can, or that we need to find fresh matches of uh, new tasks in this example, and that's also not big of a problem. For the until operator, we need to be able to track those uh, tasks over time spans, and that's also not much of a problem. But there is a problem. There's a problem with this until operator because there is this interval attached to the until operator. So this uh, this interval refers to real value time points. And we need to be able to determine whether there is a real value time point in this interval. And also, uh, we need to uh, check for the left-hand side condition of this until operator, whether it's satisfied for all those prior time points until the right-hand side condition is satisfied. This is a bit tricky, and that is basically the, the major problem of this analysis problem here. So our solution to this is that we take this time graph sequence as it is, and at runtime, we fold the information of this time graph sequence into one current graph with history. So here, G0 prime contains the information of G0 only. Uh, G1 prime contains the information of this time graph sequence up to G1. G2 prime contains the information of this time graph sequence up to G2. And lastly here, G3 prime contains information of this time graph sequence until G3. So that's uh, then a history graph that contains all that information. And based on that information, we do the following. So we take our MTGL condition Psi that we need to analyze. And what we do is we reduce this MTGL condition into two nested graph conditions. So Psi pass, psi pass is one nested graph condition and Psi opt is another nested graph conditions. And what we then do is we just check whether those uh, history graphs here, G0 prime, G1 prime, G2 prime, and G3 prime, satisfy those two nest graph conditions. And uh, based on the outcome of this satisfaction check, we generate those pessimistic and optimistic violations in our approach. So uh, I just want to shortly present how such a history graph, this, for example, is G3 prime, captures that information of such a time graph sequence prefix. For the example that we had before, this is up here. We generate the graph with history down here. So uh, folding the, the entire uh, sequence uh, up to G4 results in this graph G4 prime down here. So this graph down here contains all uh, nodes and edges that ever appeared in this time graph sequence. So even though T1 to C1, they are removed in G4, they are still available down here. And also the most important thing here is that we add uh, uh, creation timestamps and deletion timestamps to all nodes and edges. So that's the reason why we can um, say that those two representations, the time graph sequence up here and the graph with history down here, they are equivalent representations. Also, we add the global time point when this time graph sequence ended. So it's one plus two plus three plus three. That's just those nine minutes in this case. And so these are equivalent representations. 
Um, going back to this um, previous picture here, um, what I'm not going to exactly explain is how reduce works because that's a bit more difficult. But the basic point is that for this last step here with this until, um, we use that then uh, Z3 to determine whether uh, this uh, satisfaction proof that we do here is compatible with uh, the requirements of this until operator. So these um, these interval constraints are then interpreted in this nest graph condition or encoded in these two nest graph conditions, psi test and psi opt. Okay, going back to this overview picture. So basically what we, we uh, ensured is that we actually return the, the correct sets of pessimistic and optimistic violations as we specified them. And also we, we uh, came up with a prototypical implementation of that showing that this algorithm is actually also implementable. And for efficiency, well, as of now, we did not use incremental pattern matching techniques, but that is something that is um, left for the future. So that's some, some future work that we will do. Um, so this is kind of the uh, summary already of this overview picture, and I will just conclude now. So basically, our contribution is that we um, extended the analysis or, or previously available analysis for MTGL with respect to time graph sequences from the offline setting now to an online setting. So in this offline setting that was there before, it was always assumed that the time graph sequence terminated. And uh, there basically what, what we could do in principle now is with this extend approach, we can generate those true violations. And also uh, with this uh, online analysis, we can now generate optimistic and pessimistic violations that give a more fine-grained information about what happened and when did it happen in this time graph sequence. And of course, the, the use of these violations, or these two kinds of violations, depends on, of course, the application context, the, the metric temporal graph condition that is used, and what the user actually wanted to check with that. So there are different uh, ways to determine whether optimistic or pessimistic violations are more suitable. In the future, what we want to do is we want to ex extend the expressiveness of MTGL. We are already uh, working on that a lot uh, by integrating past operators, for example, and by handling attributes at a better level. And also what we want to do is we want to uh, extend uh, this work to uh, testing model checking of time graph transmission systems.